everybody uh, here on behalf of IBHE, but, but for us to get started in any, in my opinion, any um, appropriate way, I think we, I'd like to uh, have Larry Dietz, the president of ISU, come up here and welcome you to his campus. We are uh, fortunate in this state to have a, uh, an institution that, is a, as, that does as, an exceptional job as, as ISU does and under the leadership of Larry. And I, I have a, have had a chance to work with Larry for the last year because he's the convener of all the presidents of the state universities, the public universities, and does, an, I believe, an exceptional, exceptional job. And when we called and said, can we have an event here, a conference, he said, well, of course. So you can see they're going through some transitions, but uh, they opened their arms and said, come on to ISU. So Larry, can you come on up and give us an official Redbird welcome? Larry, by the way, he won't admit this, but you've seen their basketball team. He, no one knows this. He writes all their plays. And, and I, if the coach doesn't keep that to yourself just in this room, he doesn't want anyone to know that. He's the guy that writes every single play. Larry Dietz. Thanks, Tom. Well, thank you very much. I only write the plays for the games that we win, of course. You know how that goes. Uh, really appreciate all, everybody being here. Thanks so much for um, uh, navigating the construction to get in here. I would be remiss if I didn't say that the renovation that's going on in this building is happening with no state dollars involved and uh, student fees will not go up a penny. <laughs> so, uh, but we're doing some good work uh, on this building and so uh, while we do the construction and make plans for progress, it gets a little inconvenient, but appreciate uh, uh, you weathering that to get in here. Welcome to Illinois State University. It's a wonderful, wonderful university and I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce the fellow that hired me here, Al Bowman over here to, uh, was the president uh, that hired me and I really appreciate that Al. It's been a great uh, experience for me. I've been here uh, six years now and uh, I'm in my fourth year as president and uh, it's been a great institution, great faculty, staff and students and uh, you represent the same on your campuses I know and so uh, to all the uh, trustees thank you for your service on behalf of all the presidents uh, 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 represented in the room and your institutions. Appreciate your service. Tom's been great to work with, with IBHE, and uh, we've got a lot more work to do, and, uh, but I'm glad to have you all here today. Look forward to meeting everybody through the course of the day. I will, uh, as a um, uh, caveat, I will say that I just got back last night from uh, China, and so if you hear the loud thump in a couple of hours, <laughs> It'll be my forehead hitting the table in the back because it's uh, uh, going to be close to my bedtime here in about two hours. But nevertheless, uh, thanks for being here. Glad to have you and uh, look forward to a great day. Thank you, Tom. Larry, thanks. Thank you very much. I actually came in last night. I'm still kind of trying to figure this out. I went to a farm-to-table restaurant that had farm-to-table pizzas and Korean food. And um, it was actually excellent. I, I think Anju above, I'm not sure how they're getting everything over from Korea, but it was really, really good, if putting in a plug for the place. But it, I had dumplings and pizza, just still I'm not sure how that works. So the IH, IBHE, in my opinion, and I'll, I'll say this because I've been the chair, I've been kind of struggling to figure out what, what our role is and what we need to do and how we can be more impactful to help you and to help higher education in, in the state of Illinois. Obviously, over the last year and a half, two years, as a state, we've really had some huge challenges because we haven't had a budget. You've had some huge challenges because you haven't had a budget. But after, after the budget passed, we convened, I convened a group of um, members of our, our board to create a, we started a task force of what's the role of IBHE, IBHE and really where do we need to go as a state um, with higher ed and where, where can we improve uh, in higher ed using the board of higher, using the board of higher ed. Because um, I think we, we lost, we, we wasted a year because of the General Assembly's inaction, or maybe a year and a half, I guess you'd say, if not longer. And it was a, obviously a debacle in many ways. But I believe we have great universities, I have, we have good people running them, we have good boards, and, and we, there are things we can do to improve. And I want to make sure that we're engaged in that. We also not only did not have a budget for a year and a half, we haven't had a director, executive director for the last year. And for a variety of reasons that happened, and it's too bad, but that is going to change on. On, on, on Wednesday. We have an emergency board meeting tomorrow and we're going to hire an interim executive director. And you know, when, I, when I talk to people about it they, that, that are 
in the know in the Board of Higher Ed. They were shocked and, and incredibly pleased that this person was willing to do this. Uh, they didn't think he had an interest in it, and in my opinion, the fact that he has an interest and is as excited as he is and is going to be as proactive as he is is the best thing f for all of us in higher education. And I want to I want to welcome him and come up. Even though the I, Board of Higher Ed hasn't taken a vote, we're going to do it tomorrow. I've called all the members and we're in good shape on the vote. So I, I'm I'm being a little premature, but this was a good opportunity for you to at least hear from him for a minute or two and uh, help me in uh, welcoming the next executive director of the Board of Higher Ed, Al Bowman. So Al, come on up and uh, say hi to everybody. Thanks, Tom, for the kind introduction. This uh, gets me off the golf course after four years. I've been trying to get my handicap down to a single digit, and it's obviously not going to happen. Um, I'm very excited to have this opportunity and to uh, roll up my sleeves and uh, get to work with the Board of Higher Education. I first of all want to thank each of you for donating your time in, in serving on a university board. This is obviously an absolutely critical period for uh, public higher education. Um, you know, the conventional wisdom is that the most important job of a board, of a university board, is hiring a president. And that's certainly true, but I think that's only part of the picture. The other part of the picture that I think is, is just as important is holding that president and his or her leadership team accountable. You know, we obviously had uh, many challenges uh, because of the budget impasse, and certainly enrollment is at the top of the list for many institutions across the state. But these enrollment declines for some institutions actually started in the mid-1990s. And I think boards have to recognize that decisions were made 10 and 20 years ago that are impacting campuses today, and it's incumbent on our boards to ask those tough questions and to hold these leadership teams accountable. And I certainly want to be a resource as you engage in that kind of activity. I'm a phone call away, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So we're not going to sit around uh, at the Board of Higher Ed, as you can tell with, with Al. He is uh, strong, he's proactive, he's ready to go, and uh, you're going to hear from us uh, in many ways, and that's a good thing. So I became the chairman of the Board of Higher Ed about a year and a half ago, and I, what you may not know, I didn't even know it, uh, you're also the chairman of the State University Retirement System. And I, uh, the guy, the governor's office called me and said, yeah, you get about four meetings a year at each board, it's not a big deal, it won't take much time. Well. I said, who, who, put, who made you the chair of the Board of Higher Ed and the chair of the SURS? He said, well, the General Assembly did when you were there. So I'm um, <laughs> like, well, I, I couldn't say those idiots. But, uh, and so you're probably going to hear some references today from our next speaker about some of the not so smart things the General Assembly does and did, and she will point to me, and I've gotten used to it. But what, but what I want to tell you is, I, when I became the chair of the Board of Higher Ed and SURS, uh, there was a law firm representing us, Burke, Burns, and Pinelli, and Mary. Mary Pat Burns, you're going to hear from in just a second, is the head of that firm. And I was, in, I was a Republican, I'm a Republican, Mary Pat's firm has more of ties on the Democrat side, and I came to these two boards, I thought, well, it's just, you know, it's just where I want to, it's just what I want to do. And so we got to talking and working. And uh, Mary Pat is, in my opinion, as fine an attorney as you're going to find who's politically astute, um, intellectually and uh, legally brilliant. And she's going to put a presentation on it that I think is very, very appropriate for all of you as board members and presidents in the environment that we are in with the got you and uh, ranging from FOIA questions to sexual harassment now we're seeing in the General Assembly to a host of issues that you don't want as volunteers or as a university to get yourself in trouble. Um, and it doesn't mean you're doing it on purpose, but unwittingly doing things that get you, create problems for you. They're pitfalls that, you, that are, they're out there that exist on a day-to-day -day basis. And what Mary Pat, what she's done for us at the Board of Higher Ed and the State University Retirement System is kept us out of trouble. And that is to me with the optics that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and these boards very, very important. She's going to be brutally frank with you. She's going to be honest with you. You can ask her any question. She will handle it. And if she has an answer, she'll tell you. If she doesn't, she'll tell you. But it's the kind of conversation you need to have as a board member. And you need to have an understanding of these issues on a day-to-day -day basis 
um, whether as a role, or either as a, as a member of this board or as, a, as somebody that's in the world of higher ed. So we're very lucky at the Board of Higher Ed and serves to have her representing, representing us. And I believe you're very lucky to hear from her today. So please help in uh, welcoming Mary Pat Burns from, from her firm, Burke Burns and Benelli. Mary Pat, thank you very much. Whatever everybody wants. So don't be afraid to ask anything. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning. morning. It was awfully nice at Chairman Cross, but we are probably uh, evidence that you can be nonpartisan and get things done. Uh, he's been just delightful to work for, and I do blame him for everything that's wrong with the pension systems <laughs> in Illinois. I really do. Uh, I feel Thank sorry you. for him. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, good morning. I have the toughest uh, topic today because just as uh, Dr. Bauman said, uh, I think the key word is accountable. And just like uh, the good doctor told you that maybe you guys need to think about being accountable uh, with respect and holding the presidents and the leadership accountable, unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that as trustees, you're held accountable too, and you're held accountable by all of these outside bodies that put ro rules and regulations on you that you might, as Chairman Cross said, not even know about, and yet inevitably they cause trouble. I mean, how many people in this room remember the University of Illinois hiring or er, uh, admission scandal, right? It was huge, right? Everybody remembers it. And what, what happened is, do you really think the boards of trustees were all that involved with deciding who was getting into the university or not? No, they were calling administrators and leadership, but it's the trustees who sort of wore the jackets. And, and I'm gonna be brutally frank with you because you are doing this as volunteers, you aren't being paid for this, but I will tell you right now, you have incredible liability. For instance, Chairman Cross didn't know when he signed up to be head of the state university retirement system on your behalf, on behalf of all of us as taxpayers, that he became personally liable if he breached his fiduciary duty. It's, it's amazing that under the pension code, any pension, uh, any trustee that sits as a pension uh, trustee is personally liable. So he had to go home and have a conversation with the wife saying, hey, honey, public service, no pay, but guess what? We're, we're at risk if I make a bad decision. It's not that bad at a university setting, but I will tell you as someone who's uh, been doing this for 36 years and represented hundreds and hundreds of boards, you don't want reputational risk either. You do not want to be on the front of the Sun-Times or the Tribune because of something you do. So we're gonna get into it. It's, it's not a pleasant discussion to start the day with, uh, but I think it is, as uh, Tom says, critical. Okay, so we're gonna talk about governance matters. And, and I saw this uh, quote the other day when I was getting ready, and I love the fact that it was 400 and some years before Christ, but I think it does kind of sum it up. Life short, art long, opportunity fleeting, experience misleading, judgment difficult. That's what you guys are doing as trustees. Trust me, that is it in a nutshell. Now, Illinois trustees are required to uh, do what you guys do in an increasingly uncertain and complex world and uh, there's, as you know, very little reward. The reward is what Dr. Bauman said. The reward is that you are seriously making a difference to higher education and to the opportunities that are gonna be presented to citizens of the state and from other states who come to your schools. The problem is it, it gets really difficult and can get lost if and when we make mistakes. Okay, so why are we here? We're here because in 2016, after Chairman Cross left the General Assembly, so this he can't, he doesn't get blamed for this, but we can blame the uh, U of I scandal and uh, the College of DuPage scandal for this, this little debacle. So what happened is in 2016, the Illinois General Assembly enacted amendments to the Board of Higher Education Act talking about good governance, which is what we're gonna talk about this morning. And what they did is they said effective January 1, 2017, every trustee, so every one of you in this room who's a trustee has to get at least four hours of professional development leadership training every two years. And we, they give us a bunch of topics we can talk about. And today, uh, what the staff of the IBHE thought was important is we talk a little bit today about ethics and fiduciary duties in the conflicts of interest, which is where most trustees, in my experience, kind of get into trouble. So we're gonna talk about that. And then, as Tom mentioned, we might spend a little bit of time, if we have time, talking about the new 
uh, flavor of the month, sexual harassment, and why trustees need to be aware of that. Okay, so we think that uh, in, in kind of talking about good governance, uh, you know, it's been proven, and the, the scholars, which you guys are far more scholarly than I am, uh, they've proven that good governance and performance uh, results are directly tied. So it's really not a waste of your time to be doing this. If a trustee of any board, whether it's a public corporation, a private corporation, if you have good governance, you will get optimal performance. It's, it's, if you don't, if the governance is bad, it's a distraction, it leads to bad decision making. So we're just gonna kinda go over generally in the time we have some of the things we've learned under Illinois law in, uh, that are important to good governance. And I think they can be broken down into like four categories. You gotta be, as trustees, informed. You have to be independent, which is hard. You have to have integrity from the beginning to the end, the whole process, from the president of the university down to the students, and as the trustees, you have to have integrity. And lastly, you wanna be able to have an impact. So being informed. Okay, so what do you need to be informed of? Just from the law side of it, there's a bunch of acts that apply to you, and I don't know if you know that they apply to you, but they apply to you as a trustee and uh, as a university official, and they need to be complied with. It's strict liability. It's not like you can get a, a mulligan uh, and redo it. When you violate it, you're, you're, you're done. One is the Freedom of Information Act, the Open Meetings Act. You're governed by the State Employees and Officers Ethics Act. You're governed by the Governmental Ethics Act the Gubernatorial Boards and Commissions Act, and then your individual university acts. So how many of you in the room have read all those acts that govern you? Okay, so that gives you a clue of all the things and all the pitfalls that you are required by law to follow that most trustees never even see or read. Um, so it's kind of like this cartoon sort of says it all. You know, it's gonna drive you, drive you insane by the time you're on, uh, done with this conversation. Okay, so we're gonna do this in like very quick speed, but I think even later in the day, uh, there's a period where you can ask a lot of questions. We did this last year for trustees and university officials, and what happened was they started germinating during the day, and then all of a sudden th they had all these questions, like wait a minute, what about this, and how do you handle this? So you can certainly interrupt, or you can hold your questions, and we can certainly get to them later the day, in the day. Okay, so FOIA. FOIA, again, is the Freedom of Information Act. And did you know that every single email that you guys do as trustees, every single piece of paper you generate that deals with university business is subject to FOIA? So Illinois was the last state to enact a FOIA law. So we kind of fought it as long as we could, but it's with us. And uh, what, in 1999, they found that two-thirds of state governmental organizations were not complying with FOIA. And I will tell you, unfortunately for all of you, and as taxpayers, I'm paid a lot of money by a lot of bodies to comply with FOIA. And I gotta tell you, it's a ridiculous thing to have to pay someone to, to help uh, governments comply with the law but it's mainly because people aren't following it. it. And so there's constant litigation. It's like a cottage industry that's popped up. Um, a 2006 investigation by the BGA specifically showed that with respect to Illinois, 60% of our universities and our public bodies were not complying with FOIA. So what does that tell you when the BGA, uh, which is the Better Government Association, does a study and shows that people aren't complying with it, all of a sudden lawyers come out of the woodwork to sue and try to make money causing problems for people who aren't complying. And that's in fact what's happened. Since 2010, there are lawyers out there who do nothing other than sue people over FOIA. And we're gonna talk about some of the examples and the kind of business that's developed about this, but it, it, you know, be afraid, be really afraid. Okay, so just kind of in real terms, practical terms, you know, everyone knows that Mayor Emanuel is probably one of the smartest guys, very successful, but since 2017, we're in October, right? This October, almost November, uh, 54 lawsuits have been filed. 54 lawsuits, that's like almost one a week have been filed. 
in 2016, the city shelled out $670,000 in 27 settlements. And one of those settlements was in the Laquan McDonald case, which you probably read about in the paper, right? Now, what happened in that case is that, and we'll talk about it a little more later, but it's fascinating when you think about it, because I could see myself, and I'm pretty good at this, sitting in a room, and if a reporter said, hey, we want the emails that went between the two officers, not the two officers who were, who were directly involved in the Laquan McDonald case, but two officers, one was at the scene, and the other officer was working, but someplace else, and they were buddies, and one officer emailed the other officer on his phone and said, you know, WTF, you can't believe what just happened, what happened, you know, so-and-so shot so-and-so 16 times, you know, blah, 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 back and forth. What the BGA and the press wanted were those emails between the two officers on their private devices. So they weren't using state property or city property. They were emailing each other anecdotally about what was happening, and that's the, what led to the lawsuits. The video was easier. The video was a clearer case that the mayor had to turn that over. They should never have withheld that. But the money was between the emails between the two officers. And I could easily have seen myself saying, if I was asked, well, how is that related to public business? Those are two guys talking to each other. But because they were on duty, and because they were talking about something that was a matter of the public interest, those personal emails had to be turned over. But that's, that's the kind of how bad it's gotten, and that's what the fight was with McDonald. And um, now, the most recent one that you probably read about over the summer is that the mayor paid about $97,000 regarding his own emails, his own personal emails. Now, he spent all that money uh, fighting it, but ultimately what happened was he turned over all his personal emails, including things with friends of his that he didn't think had anything to do with pu uh, public business. Okay, so what's a public record? What can FOIA get? As you're sitting there as trustees and as officials, a public record are, is everything. It's the grocery list, if on the one side and the other side you say call Tom Cross about uh, attendance or enrollment issue. That's a business record. Now, the one side that has the grocery list in it isn't a public record, but the other side is. Any piece of paper, any communication, any text, anything uh, is, any recorded phone call, if you record your phone calls, all of that is a public record. So what's a real practical thing? Don't have any paper if you can avoid it. If you want to have a conversation with someone, pick up the phone. Don't write it down. Don't email it. Don't text it. Because if you do, it's a public record, and under FOIA, you're required to turn it over. Now, the other thing about FOIA is that the presumption is that every record has to be turned over. It's, every record's public. So if you're sitting here and you're the, a trustee on Illinois State and you, test, you, you email uh, Sherry Eagle and say to her, hey, I have an idea about something. Uh, maybe we could get rid of Tom Cross by suggesting to the governor that they put uh, you know, a lawyer in their job, Mary Pat in the job. That communication, you might mean it with, with Ms. Eagle as just being sort of an offhanded conversation, but that's foible. If someone knew you had that conversation, they'd be able to get it. And there'd be no way to withhold it by saying, wait a minute, she and I are friends. We were just communicating. The presumption is it's foyable because you're now public trustees. And so the burden is on you guys then to prove that it's not public. And that's a high burden, I would suggest. Okay, so uh, just as an example, uh, recently the Attorney General of the State of Illinois has held in cases where people have fought uh, turning over records, the City of Freeport fought turning over bonuses paid to its employees. All those bonuses, all of those compensations, they're all foyable and subject to public scrutiny, including the trustees thinking of how to set those bonuses. So you're in a meeting, you're talking kind of behind the scenes with your fellow trustees about, you know, should we give a raise to Larry Deitch, should we not? He's worth a million, he's worth a million and a half in bonus. Those conversations, if they're 
uh, in any way memorialized on writing, those are foyable. Your Facebook or your Skype account, just a couple months ago, the AG ruled is foyable. So someone can literally FOIA what's the trustee's Facebook account so I can go in and see what he's doing on Facebook. I mean, that seems ridiculous to me. That seems incredibly private to me, but it's not, it's not subject to, uh, to being protected. Student records is the one thing in your lives that I think remains privileged and protected. Because even in a case, in this Kentucky case uh, recently, uh, there was a sexual assault case and the press tried to get, a professor was charged by se uh, with sexual assault by two students. And the press tried to get the records, the entire personnel file and all the investigation that had been done by the university into sexual assault. And in that case, the court ruled, even though the public had an interest in knowing what was happening, student rights to privacy trumped the, uh, the, the uh, public's right to know about the, the guy who did the sexual assault. So that's like the one exception in your world uh, that might exist, I think, for FOIA. The most recent one that probably impacts you guys directly is just recently in 2007, the court ruled definitively that the College of DuPage Foundation uh, had to disclose like a federal subpoena that it had gotten. Um, and and th what's relevant about that to you guys is that sometimes you set your universities up where you have the universities, the public body, but then the trustees set up a 501c3 to be the foundation to raise money, deal with alumni, and historically, and you know, we all thought we could do everything out of the foundation and keep it private from the public university. And DuPage wrecked that for all of us. Is anyone here from the College of DuPage? Before I say bad things about the College of DuPage. Okay, because the College of DuPage and this is my, my kind of complaint always against Chairman Cross and the legislature. What happens, and what I've seen over the last 36 years of practicing law, is every single time there's something in the paper, the legislature swings really far and does absolutely obnoxious things that then keep humans from wanting to be public servants. And the College of DuPage created, I think, something like 34 laws came out of that debacle. And had they stopped and talked to a lawyer who was outside of the school system where they were all kind of self-serving, someone would have said, here's how you solve this problem. But as a result, now foundations are not separate. They are deemed to be public uh, bodies who are connected to universities. So if you're a trustee sitting at your university, and you're thinking, well, I can go to the foundation to kind of have a lunch with someone to get a million dollars donated for the student center, know that that's going to be, that's no longer protected. So, and it's because they say that foundations relate directly to the governmental function being uh, engaged in by the university. So what's the lesson from that? Anything that kind of helps you do your job as trustees, any entity out there that helps you, an alumni association, anything, it ultimately could be found to be connected. So you have to be very careful. Okay, now, this is kind of like the big, the big topic. And this is, I mentioned it before with Laquan, Laquan McDonald. But what I think you have to know, the most important thing for trustees these days, is that when your university general counsel gets a FOIA request, for any and all communications, and that's how they're phrased, because lawyers like me don't know what, what we want, so we ask for everything. Any and all communications regarding the expansion of the student center at Illinois State. Okay, pretty general, right? Up until three years ago, I would have simply done a, a Google search or a email search. I'd call the, call the IT guys and say, hey, go through U of I's computers, pull out every document that says uh, Student Center, Illinois Center, or Illinois State, and I would have gotten those. Now, the Attorney General has ruled, I have to go to my trustees of the universities and say, do you have anything on your phone or your personal email account that talks about the Student Center at Illinois State? So think about that for a minute, because I will bet, and Cross and I do this all the time, we'll text about an issue on SIRS or IBHE, and then all of a sudden we're like, 
stop, stop, call me, pick up the phone. Because even I forget, right? You make comments on your text like, even in a meeting, the, case, the cases regarding FOIA, interestingly enough, started because, can you hear me without the microphone? Oh, okay. Um, they, these guys can. Uh, I'm more of a walker around her. Um, the, what happened was two trustees were sitting at a meeting for the city of Champaign, and they were sitting across from each other, and there was an issue about voting on something, and one trustee emailed the other trustee and said, how are you gonna vote? What do you wanna do? Which is like kinda normal, I think. You know, you look for your people you trust, tell you what they think, and the other e trustee wrote back, you know, I think I'm gonna say yes, and well, what about this? You know, they were going back and forth, and somebody saw them doing that. A reporter was sitting at the meeting, and she saw, because, you know, it's in inevitable. It's like, look at your email. I sent you an email, you know? And uh, the reporter saw it, and following the meeting, it's human nature stuff, come on. The, the, the reporter actually filed a FOIA request for their communications, and the court said they had to turn them over. Now, the problem with that is I will bet in this age of communication, you have some things in your text or your emails that you really wouldn't want the public seeing, right? I mean, even if it's your wife saying, I'm really tired of you dropping your underwear on the floor in the bathroom. You don't want people to know that. Or maybe you have an issue, and this happened to one of my boards uh, on a state agency, uh, you know, having a problem with her kid with some addiction issues, and when I, she doesn't really want me to know that. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's good to have your lawyer know it. It's nothing wrong with your lawyer. But if I had to turn that over, that would be bad. So that's what has to happen. You literally have to, to be in compliance with the law, you'd have to turn your phones and your emails over to your lawyer to extract what's relevant, or you yourselves have to certify under oath that there's nothing on your phone that relates to public business. Not, not a good situation to be in. Um, so what the, what the uh, kind of the, the judge said in the, uh, most recently in, oh, so I can walk around, that's okay. In the Emanuel case is, uh, thank you, is that, uh, this is a direct quote from the judge in Mayor Emanuel's case, FOIA law does not distinguish between records kept on publicly funded devices and private ones. So there's absolutely no distinction, even if it's your phone, you pay for it. Now, you know, right, that if you use your state phone, how many of trustees get phones paid for by the university? Or computers, anything? All right, that's really good. Because uh, you really, you definitely don't want ever to use state equipment if you can avoid it because of all the rules. And we can talk about, can I use an IBG example? I mean, you know, I hate to do this, but that's how I got involved with the IBHE, or IBHE years and years ago, was that um, one of the high people, maybe the executive director, uh, was communicating on her com state computer to do things that seemed very normal to me, where someone said, hey, are you going to cross his fund, it wasn't him, but are you going to cross his fundraiser? I'm not. Can you pick up the check, though, for me? Sure, I'll pick it up before I leave. And that, that ended up with the person losing their job and never being able to be involved in state employment again. I mean, that's pretty severe, right? But it was because she used a state computer. So the best thing to do is never, if you can avoid it, take the free phone or the free computer. It sounds good. But if you do, you have to be very careful what you do with it. And that has nothing to do with FOIA. That just has to do with the law. And we'll talk a little bit about that. OK, so the Tribune case in, against the manual that we've been talking about, uh, he had to turn over thousands and thousands of his emails because he can't possibly, first of all, you know, I guess, uh, you guys probably have never been involved with the US attorney. But if you've ever gone, to, the last thing you ever want to do is have a US attorney or an FBI agent in your life, other than maybe as a loved one. Uh, and the thing about the FBI, and I've learned this too many times, is that nothing's ever off your phone or computer, right? You know that. It just never disappears. So one of my clients, when he was talking to the feds recently, they literally said, do you have your phone with you? And he gave them the phone, and they stick it in a machine and it, every single thing that's on that, that phone 
even if it's been deleted, you know, wiped out a year ago, everything just shows right back up on their, on their material. So nothing's ever gone. So disabuse yourself if you think it is. So that's what Mayor Manuel had emails, thousands of them. They had all been erased, but they're able to retrieve them all. And he was required to do that. And some of the emails like he turned over, like we were talking about, were emails that you might not want to see publicly. And one of them was one where the governor, before he was the governor, so he was not a public official when he made these comments, but he made them to a public official because he was emailing Mayor Emanuel. Because if you may recall, at one time they were friends. And so when they, uh, and they might still be friends again in the future, but right now they're at war. But uh, in one of the emails that Emanuel turned over, and you have to wonder if, if they were friends, what, whether Emanuel would have been so quick to turn this one over. So that's another thing you got to think about, because once it's out there in the public domain, you, you know, other people are controlling who releases it, which is kind of scary. But one of the things the governor said was that the CPA t CPS teachers are virtually illiterate and half the city's principals are incompetent. Now, do you really think the governor, six years later, when this became public, wanted that in the public eye that he said that? I mean, it's, it, he's the governor of the state by this point. So the uh, emails also showed where, which I think is very common in the way I grew up, where you would ask people for favors, and you know, and you did favors for people kind of back and forth. And the mayor was required to turn over emails from all these people who had been very good to the mayor, asking him for very simple things. Like uh, his top official said was at the time this email was written, he was working for Uber. And all he wanted was asking the mayor if it's possible that they could put stickers on the cars. You know, that's, that, that's not like a, anything that the public is hurt by or helped by, just it is a request of one friend to another. That was public and it ended up with, because to, it seems like a simple email between us, right? A guy who worked for the mayor as a public servant for 10 years as the mayor's chief strategist, writes his friend and says, hey, now that I'm working for Uber, could you please think about whether we could put stickers on the car to make it easier? But what happened was, regardless of whether the mayor did it, Later on, they determined that was lobbying by the friend, and he violated the lobbying laws because he wasn't registered to lobby, and so he got fined 90 grand for that email. So the, it's not that you write your friend and ask a favor, it's the fact that once you release that document, people are looking at it and thinking, well wait, that violates the, um, the lobbying act. Think you're gone, you know, or you're embarrassed. Or yeah, a simple thing, uh, I was talking to one of the trustees before, I'm a huge White Sox fan. So when the White Sox were in the World Series, constantly people were saying to me, hey, Mayor, you, you know, I got tickets. You want tickets? Do you want to go with me to game? And I would write back, oh, I'd love it. You know, it'd be great. But I'm a judge on the, U, uh, the Illinois Court of Claims. So that's a gift. I have a gift ban problem. So I always have to be cognizant that, hey, if I actually go to that game, I could be violating the gift ban and be in the paper, so I have to write back and say, thank you very much, but I'll buy my own ticket. You know, and it's, it's that complicated in your world. Trust me, it's that complicated. Okay, so, and that's what I was just saying, that as a result of the release of all these emails from Emmanuel, it's the gift that keeps on giving. He gives it away, but it causes all these problems for all of his friends who are continuing to be uh, uh, drawn into th that circle. Now, I also thought that it's important that you know this. Most of the trustees, the state, uh, are, or most of the trustees, I think, and Tom, tell me if I'm wrong, are appointed by the governor with the advice and the consent. Do they do that with the, okay. Um, did you know that the person who appointed you or the governor of your state has literally put this out there, that board members, that there's a zero tolerance policy on the use of your personal email for state business? So can all of you say in this room that you've not violated that? Now, understand, if you end up in the paper or if somebody requests your personal email, what's the first thing the governor's going to do? And it's just, it's just reality. He's going to tube you. He is going to fire you because he's going to point to this and say, if there's ever an issue, well, there is a zero tolerance policy, and I told all the board members that. 
So you're going to be on your own. So what's the bottom line? Don't use your personal email for state business. He's got a zero tolerance uh, for that. Okay, so now what are the consequences besides maybe losing your job? Two real consequences in real time is the College of DuPage and the University of Illinois. And the College of DuPage is just the most unbelievable thing. But, uh, you know, and I don't want to get into all the details of it, but it started with a FOIA from the Tribune to the radio station at DuPage, College DuPage, asking about some equipment that allegedly the, the state ra stadio manager was selling on the side. So think about how this morphs into something different. Somebody asked about equipment at a sta radio station. The radio station, because they did something wrong, doesn't turn over the documents. That gets the, the Chicago Tribune very interested, like why aren't they turning it over? Then the, the game starts happening. Once they finally get the documents, they find out that this brooder had spent over $100,000 of money. So then they started looking at the trustees. Then they found out the trustees had engaged in all this behavior. It was like a freaking snowball. It just kept coming and coming and coming, and, and, and all because of a FOIA, and all because the trustees on the board of the College of DuPage weren't watching the staff, didn't know what was happening, and didn't stop it. And ultimately, I would suggest to you, the trustees paid the price. Most of them are gone. Most of them are embarrassed. A lot of people lost their jobs in the administration. And we're all living, like I said, with the consequences. Now, um, you know, and we're going to talk a little bit about it, but look at the last line. The college fired Bruder, and then uh, they rescinded his $763,000 severance package. Now, I represent a lot of boards. And so I know what it's like. You're sitting there, you're, you're not paid, you come into a meeting, some lawyer like me is yep, 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 and everyone's talking, and you just approve things because it's human nature, right? But good governance would say you've got to ask the questions about, wait a minute, I understand everybody wants to do this, and I'm the, guy, the one guy who's saying no, but how do we get past the FOIA laws on this? How do we get past the contract laws? Why are we doing this? You can't, I always tell my boards, I don't like it when it's 100 to 0, everybody unanimous. I don't like that. And the U.S. Attorney doesn't like that. In the TRS scandal, anybody old enough to remember when the teacher's retirement system got in trouble uh, with Mr. Levine, which brought down Bogoyevich and the rest of it? That started at a pension fund. And one of the reasons the U.S. Attorney, now I'm a lawyer representing all these other public pension funds, and the U.S. Attorney came to me for help to figure out how pension funds work. And one of the questions they asked me was, how come it's always unanimous on the teacher's retirement system board? I said, well, what do you mean? Why is it always unanimous? It's unanimous because they're all in agreement. And he, they, they don't look at it that way. They looked at it like it was a conspiracy of trustees to always to get to the bad result. They didn't look at it because they were looking for critical thinking, informed trustees, and that's actually what you signed on to do. So I would encourage you, when you're sitting there and you see something like a 763 severance, you ought to be asking some questions. If for no, you could vote for it, but ask the questions, be informed. The U of I case was the chancellor. So the chancellor in this case, and you guys probably saw this in the paper, so I'm not releasing anything, so, uh, I think it was Phyllis Weiss. She literally wrote in her emails to her colleagues, we are not using our university email accounts because we don't want the FOIA laws to get, the, get us. So please communicate on your personal emails. She's gone. So those are just headlines from recent things. Okay, so that's FOIA. If that's not bad enough, you're also subject to the Open Meetings Act. And what the, yes sir? Yeah. Very reputable groups. Wonderful groups. It makes sense for that. But what about the people that are out there that are just filing FOIA stuff, you know, 30 times a quarter? We're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on that. Yeah. Do you need a drink this early? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Most women lawyers have a drink before 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. The that's bane of my existence. Have somebody that's like that. Is there something that can be done to help curb the abuse on the foil? Um, can you guys hear me with this? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, what can be done? Well, one thing is if, if we all start complying, then I think what happens is they lose interest. Um, but we've, we've given them, I showed you the earlier slide that showed 60% weren't following FOIA. So that's like a cottage industry for lawyers. It's like, okay, well, there's going to be fodder here. If we get to the point where we're all complying, I will say that I've never had a problem in 36 years. Now, the uh, FOIA law has only been around since 94, but none of my boards have ever had a problem. And it's because I answer the FOIAs, but I answer them in a very literal right way. I never give them, and I hope no, nobody in here is a lawyer from uh, any of those firms, but I never answer, uh, I give them exactly what they ask, and I don't help them. I don't care that they don't like me. I don't care that they have my face with a big red thing through it. <laughs> you know, Tim Novak at the Sun-Times literally will spit on me if he sees me in the street because I give him only what he wants. One of the things about FOIA is that you don't have to explain the documents to the person. The FOIA law says you don't have to interpret or give an explanation. Human nature is that your lawyers in-house at your universities and things, they want to explain it. They want to tell people what it means. That's the mistake. If you don't engage with these people, give them thousands of pages. Let them figure it out. Yeah, that helps. What you're, what you're talking about here that way with all due respect because one the legislature told us to do it so we have to do it so we have to comply with FOIA don't think of it as being a waste of time because the better you manage it on the front end I would suggest the better you're going to be on the back end College of DuPage felt the way you did screw these people these guys from the Tribune they're just so freaking oh, and I know I know you're not I know I'm you're not I know you're not but the point is is that they have the power to ask right so it, whether it's the guy sitting in his computer on the dark web or, or the person writing for the Tribune, they're dogged. And so the best thing to do, in my opinion, is deal with them. Do it, get it to them, and stop the nonsense. Now, there is a part in the law about repeated requesters. And if you repeatedly request, like I've got a guy every punching board meeting uh, from Financial Times or whatever who says, hey, um, uh, I want everything you discussed on the agenda, every piece of paper. So I'm supposed, you're supposed to pay me to go through all that stuff and turn stuff over? It's ridiculous. So we've got it down where we have a package put together for him uh, after every meeting and staff does it. So there's all kinds of things you can do to make it cost effective, but you can't ignore them because ultimately under the FOIA laws, they're going to win most times. I mean, other than maybe student records. And I'm not saying to be against FOIA law at all. Okay. And what I'm saying here is the frivolous abuse of yep. the FOIA law. And is there something, and maybe this is a question for Tom, in the infinite wisdom of our legislature, is there something that they might be looking at that to say, opposite. Flow a lot of money. I agree. I totally agree. I, it's the opposite, though. They're going to get worse with FOIA. I, I, that's what I would say. General Timberley will not pass a bill. I know you're, you're talking about the person that has an axe to grind or the bad employment question. So, so what we should do is you should, we should consider, uh, and, and you don't really want your records being seen by other people, so it's not like we could set up a, uh, like a association of FOIA law answers, you know, where you could shoot it to that person and that person answers it, you know, one person, because you guys don't want your records out there, you know what I mean? So it really has to be dealt with and you have to budget it in. It's not going anyplace. There's a law firm 
the Tappic Law Firm, that literally does this all the time. That's all they do. And he gets attorney's fees when he wins. So, I mean, why would he go away? Yes, sir. Has, has there been any discussion at all about um, elongating the window in which we have to respond yes. to lawyers? Because part of the issue that we deal with is that the window is fairly tight, 10 days in most cases. And so, you know, staffing wise, we, we, we have a lot of staff here that's got to respond to this. Has there been any discussion about elongating the window in which to respond? First part of my question. The second part of Not only no, but first of all, getting back to the first question, there has been a case, and the, the Attorney General ruled you cannot be compensated for the time your staff uh, spends responding to FOIAs. So that issue's already come up. Similarly, the issue's already come up. Couldn't you find out why they want it? Absolutely not. The Attorney General has ruled in a binding opinion that there's no in reason to ask the public to explain uh, why they want something. And see, that's the mindset. You work for the public, they think. So they think that the public can get whatever they want. Now, there is a law, people are trying to get more than five days. Under the current FOIA laws, you get five days to answer it, and you, get an, you can ask for an additional five days. So you get, to, to the gentleman's point, you get 10 days, or you get 21 days to respond to a commercial request. But what's a commercial request? I mean, even the, to me, the press is a commercial request because they're making money selling newspapers, but the law says it's not. You get tw those 21 day people are only the people who are sitting at their house and are gonna take the information and repackage it and try to sell it to somebody else or something. So really, but there is, we're trying to get more time and we've gotten absolutely nowhere on that. Nowhere. Jay. Yeah, I, just to comment, uh, I no longer on the board of ISU, but I was for over 13 years. During that time, I was quoted three times by the Chicago Tribune uh, related to a personnel matter uh, that the university had. So don't think that this doesn't happen very often. It very well happens to you as a trustee. Thank you, because that's really relevant to know. They, they, can, they know who you are, and they can ask anything they want. Yes, ma'am. Well, the, if you, first of all, if you don't do it, you can't charge them for the copying. Like one of the things I do that makes them hate me is I pay, make them pay uh, 20 cent, 15 cents a page for each and every page. I also don't, and so if you're late, you don't get to charge. So you'll find out that they don't like to pay, these requesters. So when I get the constant requesters, I always say to them, one, you can come down to my office at 70 West Madison, Suite 4300, to look at the documents. Well, he's not going to do that because he's got to pay to park downtown. So he's not going to want to do that. So then he says, no, copy everything. I say, okay, it's 2,000 pieces of paper, and that's 15 cents a page, so please provide me with a check. You guys are better with the math. And then I will give you a copy of the documents. Now, most of lawyers in-house at places don't do that. They don't make them pay because they don't want to be, they don't want to screw around with these people. They don't want to be mean. Be mean. Follow the law. The law allows you to charge 15 cents. My clients always say, but then they're not going to like us and they're going to come back at us. I'm like, disabuse yourself of that notice. They're never going to like us. They're going to come back, so make them pay. I have a check in my office framed from Tom, Tim Novak where I made him pay $14.10 for what he wanted and he had to write his own check. Now, I didn't cash the check because I wanted to frame it. But I do, I make them do it. I make them do it. So the law is there. Try to follow it, but you cannot stop it. You've got to build it into your budgets, and you've got to build it into your staff because it's not going anywhere. Okay, Open Meetings Act. Uh, th that's also very important to trustees because it's against counterintuitive. They want you to network. They want you to be uh, talking to each other, you want to get ideas, but if a majority of a quorum of you get together, 
you're violating the Open Meetings Act. So if you have five trustees and three trustees get together, two trustees get together, that's a majority of a quorum. So a quorum is three, two get together and just say, what do you think about this new president? Do you think we should hire him? You violated the Open Meetings Act. And it doesn't matter if you do it at the grocery store. So you gotta be really careful about the Open Meetings Act. And you know, FOIA has become so established that this is where the new frontier is. This is where people are, are filing suits. The lawyers have kind of mastered FOIA. Now they're evolving into, hey, trustees are violating the Open Meetings Act. One of the ones I found particularly reprehensible recently was a, a community college board meeting where the community college guys were in the room. They were in closed session. The door was closed. And the reporter peeked through the window and saw on the um, screen that they were talking about things that were different than she thought when they went into closed session. And so she challenged it and she won. So for instance, they went into closed session on 2C1 of the Open Meetings Act to dis discuss employee issues. But while they were in there and they were talking about employee issues, they kind of morphed into talking about construction of another building or something. And the uh, Attorney General in the court said, no, you violated the Open Meetings Act. Everything you did was invalid. I mean, like, it's crazy. So, but what does that mean? You gotta be really strict and follow the Open Meetings Act. Okay, so literally, as I said, a meeting is a gathering of a majority of a quorum. You don't even have to be talking about, it. you could start out talking about the weather, and if you morph into uh, uh, talking about something that you may someday vote on. So that's the issue for the Open Meetings Act. It's not, it's talking about something that you may vote on six months from then, you still violated the Open Meetings Act. So this is what we were talking about with the, just now about the community college. So they were meeting and they talked about all this normal stuff, which I'm sure you guys talk about when you go into closed session, but they hadn't uh, said they were gonna do that and it ended up being a violation. Just recently, you know, the new kind of, uh, I said the new topic and I, I gave you a package in your books to talk about uh, to look at, but the new issue is a, a severance for uh, college presidents. Let's just face it, that's, that's the thing that's not gonna change. And more, more re most recently, Northern was just uh, held for violating the Open Meetings Act, and they went into closed session to talk about Baker's situation, and they were in there for seven hours. I mean, can you imagine a seven hour open meeting, a closed meeting, you'd go nuts, right? But they actually, the complaint, uh, Somebody filed a complaint and said that they weren't clear on the agenda what they were talking about when they went into closed session. And so then the court ruled in their favor and attorney's fees were paid and they have to redo it. They had to go back in and do it again because it was inviolate. Okay, so you, we talked about being informed and we kind of blew through that. that, that that's, not that's not true. Oh, that's what they said though, the judge said. No, I'm sorry, you have to get that information. Okay, what'd they do? It, it, is, it is still in the court. Oh, it's still in the court, okay. So we'll see what happens, but that's what they're looking for. They're looking to violate what they did in terms of the review and things. Because there's a new rule that says that you, can't, you have to have the review be public, which makes no sense to me, but they, under FOIA, and that you have to get it to the public before you take action on it 48 hours in advance, which seems to be, I think, kind of, kind of encroaching upon what you do as trustees, as uh, President Bauman said, that, Really, it's like picking the president should be within your jurisdiction, and the public's getting into that, I think. So we'll see what they do in the court. Okay, you have to be independent. Okay, so the m m main thing with being um, independent is to make sure you watch conflicts. And there's really, you can identify the conflict, and then I think you have to figure out how to manage the conflict. And so a conflict under the law arises when a trustee has to make a decision where uh, maybe he can't be, or he or she can't be honorable to their commitment, which is to do what's in the best interest of the constituency, and if you can't separate your personal or financial interests from that. And so that, that's really what a conflict is, and they happen all the time, and they happen in kind of, in my mind, very nuanced ways. One that we're dealing with uh, recently was a person who's on a not-for-public board, I mean a, a private, uh, uh, yeah, 501c3 board. Uh, so she, you're on the board, you're not paid, you're, you're dealing with all this information, and you approve 
a group of people and not knowing that you have someone on that list who's close to you, you know, like a, a relationship. You know, that unfortunately is a conflict and can violate uh, your duties and end up with you being uh, kicked off the board. So what do you have to do? You have to make sure that you disclose any actual or potential conflicts and almost immediately you can deal with them. If you have a conflict, if you tell about it, all you simply do as trustees is recuse yourself from voting. You just say, hey, I'm not going to vote. I don't feel like I can do this. It doesn't cause you to go off the board. It causes you not to vote on that one action. But if you go ahead and vote on the action when you shouldn't have, you could end up getting kicked off the board. So it's a really easy thing in my mind uh, to manage. And it just is some, takes you being uh, very informed, like our first topic, and knowing what's on the agenda and doing it ahead of time. The situation we're dealing with now where um, the person voted on something not knowing a family member was going to benefit from it, immediately upon being told about the conflict, this person resigned from the board and, and their uh, relative refused the scholarship. But it, her response, which was a natural response, was, I, I had no idea. Like, I would never have done it. But it just, it was too late then. It was too late to protect her. One, so it's always good to kind of bring it up first, because uh, you can always, in my mind, manage a conflict some way. Okay, so whether you're elected or appointed as a, uh, a member really shouldn't change your conflicts because you owe what's in the best interest, you owe a decision to do what's in the best interest of the university. And so, but you can, like I said, have conflicts depending on who appointed you or whether you're elected. At the pension systems, we deal all the time with union elected trustees. They're, they only, they get elected because the union gets everybody out and helps them win the election. But once they start serving as trustees, they're not responsible for the interests of the union anymore. It's, they're required to do what's in the best interests of the university. So for, or if you're appointed by the governor. So what happens if you get a call from the governor's office telling you how to rule on something or how to vote on something? Technically, that's a conflict of interest if you go along with what the governor's office suggested unless you make an independent, informed decision that you think is in the best interest of the university. You can't just take the phone call and they say, hey, we want you to vote for A, and just say, okay, fine, I'll vote for A. Uh, you know, back, getting back to the teacher's retirement uh, scandal, what happened in that was that those board members were all good-hearted people sitting around the table, but that Mr. Levine, Levine had access to the governor, and he literally would walk up to a trustee and say, I want you to vote to give money to the Carlisle, and I'm making this up, the Carlisle group. And the trustee would say, well, I just got here. I, I don't know anything about the Carlisle group. And the trustee would say, Levine would say, uh, or Levine would say, hey, the governor wants you to do this. Do it. And the trustee would vote for it. And that, that, that was problematic when they all ended up uh, getting into trouble with the U.S. Attorney. You, you can take the call, but you have to remember you have a conflict unless you make an informed, independent decision. Okay, uh, what are the most common? Uh, the most common conflicts are uh, personal and financial. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, you, got, you know that better than, than anyone else, what your personal conflicts might be. But I would suggest you always reach out to your attorneys before you vote on anything. Uh, an example, again, of how far this has gone with the conflicts is the Illinois State Board of Education. The chairman of the Illinois State Board of Education was involved for three years with this huge fight with the OEIG. And everyone knows what, who the OEIG is, right? The OEIG is the Office of Executive Inspector General, and they have police powers over you as trustees to investigate any fraud, waste, or abuse in any state agency and the law deems all of your universities to be state agencies. So they're really the police power over you. And they've got really deep, deep reach. They have subpoena power. They can call you in for wit to be a witness. And, but this is, shows you how obnoxious this is in terms of the State Board of Education. They were just voting on um, the No Child Left Behind waiver application. It was just a question of should they seek a waiver or should they not? And they went back and forth as a board, and the chair got involved uh, 
extensively in the discussion because the chair had an interest in No Child Left Behind and he wanted the waiver because he thought it hurt. Without the waiver, he thought special education uh, services would be cut. And so, but unbeknownst to him, at least what he, what he uh, argued in court, was that uh, his wife had an ownership interest in a small company that gave services to special ed and that was affected then by the waiver even though he didn't own any portion of the company and it wasn't a direct link that she was getting doing business with the state she certainly might do business with the state but she wasn't currently doing business with the state and the OEIG concluded he violated his ethics and he is no longer chairman of the Illinois State Board of Ed so it's not just a conflict that you have when you serve as a trustee, it's also a conflict that your spouse or your significant other or any immediate family member living with you might have. So every time you vote on something, I would caution you if you have any interest at all or anyone you know or love has an interest, you make sure you disclose it or you could end up, you know, like the, the chairman of the Illinois State Board of Ed who ended up uh, spending a lot of attorney's fee money uh, to get himself whacked at the end. And believe me, he was a public servant. Okay, integrity kind of goes to the, uh, the next slide, which is good governance requires you to act, uh, obviously, with integrity. And we talked about a little bit the Ethics Act. Quickly, um, we'll talk a little bit about the Gift Ban Act, because I think this is a, a real hole for a lot of trustees. If you accept anything more than $75, in terms of a meal, you're, you violated the Gift Ban Act. So even as a trustee, so uh, in real life drama, uh, we, you know, the IBHEs had some issues with this, with former people who were at the IBHE. So you go to a U of I football game and they give you a nice leather jacket with your name on it because you're the executive director of the IBHE. Is that a violation of the Ethics Act? The OEIG said it was. And it was, be and the person's like, but my name's on the jacket. I'm supposed to give it back to the guy? How rude. But that's how the OEIG, because uh, you can't accept anything of minimal, anything above minimal value. And they've interpreted minimum value being less than $25. So if someone gives you a cup, a mug, a hat, maybe as a trustee you can take it. A leather jacket that says U of I booster and has your name on it, that violates the ethics laws. And it's a gift ban violation, and one of the reasons why the person's no longer at the IBHE. What is a prohibited source? A prohibited source, a good question, is anybody who uh, seeks to do business or does business with uh, the university. So think about it. What is seeks to do business? I mean, I can understand doing business. Each of you could say to your general counsel at your university, give me a list of everybody we do business with. That way you'd know. But now it says seeks to do business. I mean, doesn't everybody kind of want to do business with the university? So you have to be very, very careful. But if anyone who conducts activities regulated by you guys, anyone who has interests that may be substantially affected by your decisions, or anybody who's registered as a lobbyist, those are prohibited sources. So really, the best advice I always give trustees that I help is don't take anything. It's, it's just not worth it. You go to a dinner, and you can eat on the premises, which is like always hilarious to me, because I guess trustees in the old, old days used to take it to go. Like, can you pack up three or four meals? So they said, <laughs> which are like a hilarious, but they said you can eat on the premises up to $75. So you're going to a conference and you're you know, having a really good time and all of a sudden the person at the table, because it's Jay and he has really great taste, he says, I'm gonna get a $400, $500 bottle of wine because you know, he, he knows good wine. You literally are then stuck because you're at a dinner you thought was gonna be $75 and now you're participating in a $500 bottle of wine. Do you say to yourself, well, I'm only having one glass, you take four glasses, you divide it by 100, you know, it, it's a mess. Now, what you can do is, and, and the thing that you gotta remember and what I'm trying to do and why this topic is very practical is I'm giving you examples that really happened and one of the things that happened was a trustee was at lunch with uh, a vendor from one of the investment firms, and this trustee thought they were friends 
because they had known each other for 10 years in the city of Chicago. It's a very sm big city, small world. You know, they were together all the time. They had a nice lunch. Someone saw them having lunch, reported it, and the trustee was like, don't, Mayor, this, I got this, Mayor. This, I've, th this is my good friend. I mean, I bought him lunch. He's bought me lunch. We've, we've, we've gone out with our wives. I mean, he's like, we're good. Well, it turned out the friend had deducted it off his business expenses. So that's, that means you're not friends. If the person writes it off, then the government looks at that as a business deal, not a friend deal, and this trustee ended up not being a trustee anymore. So you have to think about it. Do you want to sit down with your friend and say, hey, are you going to write this lunch off that we're going to have? You know, because if you're going to write it off, I got to pay. You know, it, it's better just not to do it as trustees. You got to remember that it's $50 or excuse me, it's $75 in a meal, $100 cumulative in any year. And people do watch this stuff. Now, you make a mistake. You go and you have a $500 bottle of wine. What do you do? You, the next day, uh, you know, I would report it. I mean, I would tell my, somebody, like a lawyer or somebody, I'd say, hey, by the way, I went out, I wrote it. I get emails all the time from trustees. Just to let you know, I went to dinner, I'm making a contribution today to a 501c3 charity because that's what you can do. You can self-fix it by turning around, if you accept something that's higher value than you're allowed, making a contemporaneous uh, donation to a 501c3 charity. But don't wait to the end of the year to do it, and then like when you and your wife give to the Cancer Society, say, P.S., this is for all the bad things I did. You know, the, the, it's harder to get away from that. Uh, it's better to do it right at the time. Now, there are obviously exemptions. You can, you know, get uh, gifts from your family. You can get, you can you pay for market value. You guys know in the paper about the, the, I'm sure you've read about the trustees who've gotten loans from banks on better terms. That's a gift. So you want to be really careful. Someone wants to give you a car or lease you a car because he's a big donor to the U of I and he has a car dealership or something or, or Illinois State, don't take it. Pay fair market value. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Any 501c3, but do me a favor, just on the bottom of the check or make a note, you know, in, lo in payment for going to uh, Spiaggia or, you know, so that uh, it's covered, so that no one says, well, he always gave to the foundation every year. Well, how is this any different? Yes, sir. How nice. Right, but see, that's a perfect example of a problem that he resolved ahead of time by asking and having it resolved. And then there's probably a piece of paper someplace that says that you asked, they resolved it. You can be wrong, but as long as you make an effort to try to solve it, the OEIG looks at that in a different way. In other words, even when you talk to a lawyer, and I don't want you encouraged to do bad things, but advice of counsel is a great defense because it shows that you tried. And even if you get bad advice, you're protected. So in that situation, I agree. It's not an ethical violation because they can waive it. And so for instance, the rules that govern you also govern, like Tom, at the State University Retirement System. And there's conferences all the time that trustees attend. So what we do is, and they say, well, they're free. Well, nothing's free to the OEIG when you're a trustee, nothing. So get that out of your heads. And so what we do is we call them up and we say, what's your public fund rate? What do you charge public funds or trustees? And they'll say, I don't know, 10 bucks. Okay, then we pay the 10 bucks. But we've paid for it, you know, or some de minimis amount. So you're not getting a gift. Yes, sir. Um, so the school's foundation is having their annual big gala event and a trustee buys a table uh, at the fair market value what they're charging everybody else. And he or she invites another trustee to be their guest. 
Well, that's okay because um, a trustee's not a prohibited source because the trustee's never doing business with the university. But on top of that, there's an exemption in the rule for charitable events. So that's how they get around that because of all the golf that the legislators do. They carved out charitable things because then they can go golfing. No offense. Go ahead. No, but on, on all of these, in terms of, and maybe you said this, I can make clearly. If the, the, the dinner and if you want to write a check to the foundation, aren't you better off calling the local the council or the ethics officer and say, hey, I might have made this mistake. I, I want to give 70, I want to give a check to $75 to the Western Illinois yep. Foundation. Is this the best way to do it? So you've got a trail between. Yep. I mean, that, that, that gives you cover with the OEIG. 100%. So always, to, to Reach that. out to your lawyers. That's what they're for. And they'll help you. They'll write a memo and give you cover. Because there's always a solution to every problem. That's, it, there always is a solution. The key is when people don't ask for help to get this a solution. Because once it ends up in the paper, it's too late. But if you, I guarantee if you call your lawyer contemporaneously, they'll figure it out. Yeah? What about within the university? Like university gift, I mean, you to one of your colleagues? Um, you know, that's a really good question. I would say that that's, you, that's not anyone trying to influence any business, so that would be fine. They allow intergovernmental gifts or interagency gifts. So as long as you're, like, you're a, are you a worker at the university and, or if you're a trustee outside of it, they give you a shirt. I think that's interagency. You serve their purpose. I would, I would rule that. I mean, I would. A football ticket, same, interagency interagency. Okay, so in real life, the, the problems, because again, we're talking about real life problems, so that you don't think I'm just yammering up here. One recent one with the Illinois Department of Transportation, and again, I picked this one because I thought I could see it happening. A woman uh, worked for IDOT. She goes to her service station. She's always go there with the car, single mom. She, her daughter has a chance to go to Europe for studying. Um, She's talking to the guy all the time about how she'd really like her daughter to be able to take advantage of this opportunity, but she can't afford to fly her over to Europe. And the guy says, hey, I'll give you a ticket. Now, she, doesn't, she works for IDOT. She doesn't regulate the service station, but he is regulated by IDOT. That violated the gift ban act. So she took the ticket because she thought they were friends and neighbors. But because, unbeknownst to her, the guy was regulated, uh, that, that was a violation. That what she tried to do then to make it worse is she tried to pay it back like it was a loan. Don't do that, because then that shows bad intent. When something happens and there's a problem, call the person, a lawyer, and fix it. She made it worse, and she's banned from ever working in state government again because they looked at it like she was trying to cover up. Uh, U of I had one um, recently uh, where somebody who was a vendor gave tickets just to the Bulls and White Sox games, but. In, because they had a long-term relationship between the university official and this vendor, and they, they were friends, they threw in like a use of a rental apartment in California. Hey, I've got an apartment in California. Your family's going out there. Why don't you use it for a couple days? No big deal. That seems really human to me, very generous to me, and yet that's a violation because he's a pro prohibited source and uh, the official obviously got in trouble. Okay, uh, one of the really big things, I know we're, you guys are probably getting tired of all this, is that it's really important to remember that as trustees you can't engage in political activity while you're on state property. Um, we see more and more cases all over the place where uh, people just inadvertently violate this and they're not even thinking about it. We had some university professors who one of their colleagues was running for Congress and simply said, hey, can you pass out my flyers at the national conference you're going to of scientists? Uh, I think they'd like my candidacy. Maybe you could raise some money for me. They used the state uh, computer to, s he used his personal computer to send the email, but he sent it to his colleague on her state computer. You know, violation. And all of them got in trouble. And when you look at their, what the, um, when you look at what the uh, trustee said, or excuse me, the professor said in terms of uh, why they didn't think that they were in trouble, like when you look at it, they were saying, you know, the university professors admitted that they knew that they were not supposed to do it, 
but it was minuscule error. You know, one of the trustees said, hey, I get 6,000, excuse me, one of the professors said, I get 6,000 emails a week. And this was like one of them. And it, it was a minuscule error, and they couldn't believe that time was being wasted by the government on something so stupid. And OEAG still found them all violating state law because any email, so you get an email on your, your computer or your phone from one of your colleagues saying, hey, uh, if, it's, if you're on state property, and it's not just use of state equipment, it's if you're on state property, and again, this is all considered state property, although this may have been paid for without state money, but in case any money was used in this, it's deemed to be state property. And then when you get an email like that, my advice is immediately send back saying, please don't send it to me. Um, I'm working on state property right now. I'll get back to you later. You know, something like that. Just respond to the email. Yes, ma'am. Just a quick question for you. Um, we all get multiple emails a day. If that email had not been opened, would you still be uh, under the same thing Um, yeah, because, I mean, I think that helps your case a lot. Uh, if you don't open it because that shows that you didn't have knowledge. Uh, I don't, I'm not savvy enough computer-wise to know if they'd be able to tell that. You know what I mean? Can they tell you didn't open it? Yeah, okay, so then I think that gets you off the hook. But it's always better to be affirmative and write back to the people and say, don't do that when I'm at a trustee meeting. You know, unfortunately, I'm at a trustee meeting on state property. Please don't email me. Yes, ma'am. One hundred percent. You're an American citizen. You can contribute to people. You can be actively involved in the political activity of uh, nationally or locally. You just have to draw the line and can't use state property or be on state property to engage in political activity. Okay, so I think we're out of time, and I don't want to take any more. I do want to tell you that impact's important because leadership's an action, not a position, and so you really have to sort of watch out Please read your slides because the new things are the university severance. And I passed out in your handbook the BGA's most recent article that was just published yesterday where it listed all of the severance agreements that have gone on in the last couple years. And that really touches upon trustees. I think they're coming after you guys on that stuff. There's going to be a lot of uh, scrutiny on that. And lastly, because of the sexual harassment, sort of the flavor of the month, and I don't mean to diminish be de minimis about it, but it's coming. And uh, if you think about it, the different kinds of sexual harassment, uh, these are just the headlines just uh, in the last couple months about Uber and Weinstein. And the reason I was pointing that out to you is that in all those cases, they're going towards boards of trustees. They're beginning to try to make a case that, because that's the deep pocket. So they're trying to make a case, and it's, I think it's going to start coming into the public uh, sector, and that is that if there's pervasive sexual harassment in staff or on campus, that you guys as trustees are responsible for it. So start thinking about it because, you, again, you want to take care of problems before they happen or minimize them. Like my whole job is always with my clients to minimize risk, and my best advice is, we don't have time, but start focusing on it. Ask your lawyers questions about it. Make sure there's policies and procedures in place. Make sure you understand them, and make sure you're covered by insurance on that kind of stuff. Everybody should be thinking about that. You're indemnified as trustees under the, under the state law. You'll end up in my court, the Court of Claims. But you're indemnified, but you're not indemnified if you acted willfully or negligently. So you want to make sure sexual harassment could conceivably be construed to be a, uh, a situation where trustees were like acting outside the scope, you know, they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing, in that case you'd lose indemnification. So be very careful, okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry we talked so much. We actually, if you've got, you don't mind, we've probably got about five or ten more minutes for questions. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry. Yep, no, no, sorry. I mean, let me, maybe this goes without saying, and I apologize if you all know this, but I have my legislative Yeah, it gets awkward. Say, no. But the easiest thing, the easiest thing is to say no thanks. I appreciate it. You're very kind. But I just have a policy. My board has a policy. I personally don't take nothing. And it's just simple. It's but the hard thing about that, though, with 
all due respect, is trustees are encouraged to go to conferences and are encouraged to, to, to develop expertise in these areas. And when you go to those conferences, it's inevitable that people are going to want to take you out. And sometimes at those dinners, you learn things and you meet people. And it's ridiculous now that you can't take the dinner. But Tom's right, but you got to kind of be practical. So what about if you pay your own way? Yeah, well, yeah. Different. Yeah, I think you just need to say it. That's something we need to say because I've done I mean, things, you know, but I pay. Right. That, you that's what you're saying. The book is in the same world. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you do it. You say, I'm going to take care of it myself. Thanks. I'd be glad to go. That, those kind of things. Yeah, you can always pay yourself. Right, but, but I mean, that's something. Yeah, that yeah that's the way to handle it. That, that's <laughs> the safest way, not, for sure. Well, and not, you know, to not say, don't go, but say. You go, know, but pay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have two questions. One is um, let's get Weinstein what, off. What about gifts or dinners the, the, you know, from a trustee to just an employee, or if you go out to dinner with a chancellor and you pay for it, is that allowed? Not allowed. That's allowed. That's allowed. If you if you pay for the, it's not for you. Are you you're a trustee? Yes. And you want to take out the chancellor? If you just want to have dinner. Yeah. A professor, or sure. And, or you have uh, football tickets, and you want to give them to one of the guys that works at the at the union, or whatever. Again, if it's an intra-agency or sort of you same university, yeah. I think that's a little safer. If you have, as a trustee, you have your own business where you're also involved in. Um, no, I'm just saying, like hypothetically, you're like a, a lawyer. And then you know you want business from the university, so a lot of it's intent too. What's your purpose? Okay. You could get in trouble for that. Right, but assuming if none it's, of that, yes. you're just trying to be nice to some university yeah. employee and give your basketball tickets. Is that okay? That's fine. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yes, and I know that's painful, and uh, that's why I'm smiling at Tom because, like, the chair doesn't want to have three phones. You know, he doesn't want to have three phones. So what we came up with as a solution is we had three boxes put on his phone: one box for SIRS, one box for IBHE, and then uh, you kind of your regular one. And then all the emails that he does from IBHE, he goes to that email box on his personal phone, and then. He uses SIRS box for that. So when he turns over his phone to me when we get a FOIA, I only go into the SIRS box or the IBHE box. It's not mixed with his grocery list and his kids, you know, how the football game go and that stuff. And is there a reason it has to be done that way? If no. You have your, your own business and you keep all your emails and all that because I, I, mean, I know a lot of people aren't doing it that way. Oh, I know. And remember what the governor said, zero tolerance for using your personal email. So you're, you could have your own phone and just know that you might have to turn it over for people to look through, okay? If you have a state phone paid for by the university, well, paid for by the university, then you've got all those problems with respect to, yes, it's easier, you can just say, here's my business phone that I use for my trustee job. But if you use it accidentally for political or anything, uh, it's you get it gets more complicated, right? Because it's a state paid for a telephone. So uh, it's a hard answer. The safest answer is you have two phones: state phone for trustee business. I'm not answering the question. I still understand that question. The thing about the governor's point that zero dollars is your personal email for state business. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, like, good question. I mean, Using of your phone, there, he means if you have your your phone that you and your wife have on it's Verizon plan, and you communicate. What tr what school are you a uh, trustee at? University of Illinois. Okay, so you have U of I, and you Tom Barrows emails you, and you respond to him. You've used your personal cell phone for state business. But personal and corporate are the same. Yeah, exactly. Yes, sir. Yeah. Since we are at the same institution, like right. broad scope of stuff. I get 
tons of emails from people telling me stuff, complaining about stuff <laughs> about the university because they know the trustee. They've known me for years. They send it to my Gmail, right? I always answer from the new Illinois or forward on or whatever, but we're not accountable or receive only for what we send, right? Well, both. I mean, if, if they ask, if a FOIA comes in and says any and all communications regarding complaints received from professors at U of I, your phone would have to be turned over for the incoming. You know, if your practice is, as soon as you get it to your Gmail account, you forward it on and say, please use my U of I email address, that is how I will respond to you, then, then they're not going to go any further than just look at your phone. You know what I mean? Because that's your practice. So inadvertent things don't bother me. But any state business on your personal computer or personal phone renders that phone subject to being turned over for FOIA purposes. Now, do you care? Just be careful what you do on your personal email. But the governor's office is different. He says zero tolerance. So to him, if you got, if there's a headline in the paper, hypothetically, U of I gets involved in a scandal because of sexual harassment. Just that's the big thing. And hypothetically, they ask you to turn over your phone. And hypothetically, on your phone, they see you communicating with <coughs> a vendor about something. And that gets, that's what gets the, the papers to write a story. Oh, trustee at U of I uh, engaged in discussions with Grosner regarding a concert or something. Okay. The governor, if that ends up in the paper, he's going to ask you to resign because he's going to say you violated his zero tolerance policy. Now, it's only a headline risk. It's not a, a legal risk. I mean, you're not going to jail. But it's, you've got to think as a public servant, when you're not getting anything from being a public servant, you're doing it, I believe, out of the goodness of your heart to advance higher ed, advance U of I, serve the governor, whatever. And sometimes that gets tainted if you end up being in a, uh, a headline situation. They, the, the legislature passed a law for pension funds. And don't forget, we're about five years ahead of you on the, the scandal scale at the pension funds because of TRS. And they passed a law that said every trustee of a public pension fund has to have a pension fund address from which to operate all state business. So, like Tom has to have an I, uh, SIRS org or whatever it is email account. It's coming for you guys too. It's just a matter of time. The governor's already said he wants you to be using U of I ed emails when you're doing state business. All the trustees of Western have their own university email address. Yeah. And I'm in a law firm. By the way, we yeah. have a problem. We have to provide all this information. Right. I do the same thing for the court of claims. I'm a judge on the court of claims, and I have a separate email. I have a separate computer all set up because for my law firm, I don't want my client's business because I'm subject to probably FOIA too. I mean, because I'm a judge, it's harder to get it from me. But they can look at all my records too. Yeah. Good. See. So yeah. Painful, but probably uh, something you should think Let's about. Let's do one more question, and then we will be back here. <coughs> networking session, Mary Pat and I are gonna help moderate. We can we need to spend the whole time on that we will. Sure. But let's get let's get one more question we'll take a five minute break and then start with the financial side of it. Going to the board if we had the board council come to every meeting and uh, versus in house general counsel to the university. And it just seemed like one of the few places the board could say this is an expense we don't need. Uh, at every meeting we'll call on you when we need you. Where does that conflict exist? Yeah, I think that's a, a dynamite question. I told Tom I thought that would be the question I would ask as a trustee. Uh, I personally, but I represent, don't forget from just full disclosure, I'm board counsel for all kinds of people. I think boards need their own counsel. I don't think uh, oh, university. Okay. So, so we have one. Good. We're on retainer. Good. But we just don't want need them coming to every meeting. Yeah. They just sit there. That's not an issue. No. So where are the times that you say hey, this is a board issue? I think, 
Yeah, and I think every trustee might have a different situation on that. I definitely think anytime any trustee has an issue, they should call their board counsel, not general counsel. No offense to Mr. Barrows or any of the great lawyers at any of the universities. I also think that if I, I think that there should be a practice of general counsel running the agendas by the fiduciary council before the meeting so that the board council can say, hey, the Open Meeting Act requires you to disclose that you're gonna take action, make sure you fix it. Yeah. And I've helped the governor's office and both part of, Quinn, uh, Rauner, I've, I've helped the governor's office a lot of times because they get mad when they see agendas and the agendas don't say what their people are gonna do with them. So I think that's an important factor. Then I think that when you're doing something that you know instinctively is gonna get press, you ought to have your board fiduciary council there to help you. For instance, if you were doing a severance package for a university president, thinking of terminating, someone should be there to advise you as trustees of the things that could happen that you might want extra help on. Because the university may want to get rid of the person or want to help the president, because they're all kind of, they know each other, but you as board members. General counsel reports to the yeah, president. Yeah, gets, gets paid by the general counsel, so. so. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm sorry, I hope it wasn't too long. <laughs>
for this morning. Um, actually, a graduate, as I found out, of ISU. And uh, so he is also with AGB as a consultant, has been involved in higher ed and, and a leader, in leadership roles, not only here in Illinois, but as well Wisconsin, Maryland, and New York. Almost the whole part of the Big 14, right? With the exception of New York. But, but, but who knows? It's only a matter of time. So we're going to talk about uh, the board's role in financial oversight. Obviously, gets more and more important um, given how we're handling, or given how the General Assembly is handling financial issues and budgets in the state of Illinois. So with that, uh, let's please welcome uh, Buzz Shaw. So thank you very, very much for being here, Buzz. Thank you, Tom. I like to move around. It keeps me from, I can see you when you fall asleep this way. <laughs> This has been a really, uh, is it on? Okay. This has been a, a, a wonderful time for me so far. And I, I've seen some old friends and some young friends. Uh, and I saw someone that I taught when I taught for two years after graduating from Illinois State who said I was one of his favorite teachers. And I have to tell you, that has made my day. It really has. I don't care what you do to me. And uh, legal counsel's still here. Oh, boy. I don't care what she does to me. I'll be okay. Uh, we're going to do this. And uh, uh, it, I feel a little insecure now having heard how knowledgeable my colleague uh, is in her field. Uh, I'll confess to you. I, didn't, I don't have a degree in, in business. I have a PhD, uh, mainly in social psychology. And uh, how did I handle budget matters? I think I handled them very well, but that's not the topic, uh, how I handled them, as much as how I could do it without having a, uh, uh, a finance degree. And the way I could do it was, first of all, I was always very good at arithmetic. That helped. But the second thing is that when the finance uh, person, or persons many times, would come to me to explain something, I'd say, I only had to do this once or twice. You, you understand that I don't have a real strong background in this. That makes them feel pretty good, right? Uh, and so then I get the book and I say, well, if I don't understand something, it's your fault. And that really saved me a lot because then the explanation got down to my arithmetic level and it's really, uh, most of it is basic arithmetic. Frankly, it is. Okay, so let's see if I got this right. Oops, let's try this one. Hello. What do I do here? What am I, what am I doing wrong? Oh, here we go. Okay, here's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to quickly restate the obvious, um, and that's just so we're all on the same page. And you've heard enough of it, you've experienced it, and you deserve a two-minute uh, discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about dealing with today and tomorrow, a little off topic, but not really. And third piece is what I'm here for. Your essential role in financial oversight through audit, through finance, and through all the things that occur. And we're going to, you know, if there's a take home here, the take home is, um, what is the take home? Yeah, it's changed. I was a college president for 28 years, and I can tell you how much it's changed. I won't, I don't want to go into nostalgia, but you will see the responsibilities are not nearly as onerous as the last segment that you just went through. So that's the good news. But let's lighten the load first. I, I teach leadership. Whoops, here we go. Here we go. Uh, I teach leadership, and I've always said, and I've had some of my best mentors I like to work with because it was fun. Okay? So anyway, maybe these aren't fun, but I find them fun. From the violent nature of the multiple stab wounds, the person was probably a consultant. I suspect that's true. Uh, and it's PowerPoint. Well versed in the art of torture, do you know PowerPoint? Oh boy, I don't have to worry about this one anymore. Some of you do as I look out into the audience. If we take a late retirement and an early death, we're going to be okay. We'll squeak by. A little scary. Um, it's just kind of a timely day to have this come up, but in the state of Illinois, it's always a timely day. This is what happens when ethical standards are set artificially high. Oh, boy. 
Um, one of the things I've noticed in my working with large bureaucracies and state systems are bureaucracies, uh, state government is a bureaucracy, and universities, for the most part, are bureaucracies, is that we really beat on people when they make a mistake. And that is a serious mistake. We should be encouraging people to take initiative and not to just say no because they went to page 36 of the rule book. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, my, my good friend. Uh, I need to blame someone for the failure of this project. Use the plunger of blame. Please tell someone that he's patting me on the back right now. Well, you get the idea. And this is another leadership thing. It's good to have balance in your life, but it's also very good not to have too low of self-esteem. All right, question for you. Because you've, you've sat a, a lot. Um, I know at least one of you apply to this. How many of you were born before 1945? Raise your hand. Well, come on now. I know there's someone here. I'm the only one? <laughs> I don't believe that. Okay, I'm the only one. How many were born between 46 and 1970? That's most of you, okay. After 1971, one, two, three, a few of you, okay. I'm gonna give an honest person a chance to admit that they were born before 1945. There's no one here? I am so old, I'm old as dirt, okay. Um, I asked, I mentioned this because our perspectives about higher education in the state of Illinois is going to be different depending on when we were here. Um, I was born in 1939. You don't have to do the math to know I'm old. Uh, I went to Illinois State in 1957. There were 3,300 students, two-thirds of whom were women. That wasn't a bad deal. Uh, but uh, that was small. It was a small, intimate place where the president, Dr. Bone, would know everybody's name. And he once said to me, as I, he saw me the next day, I saw you walking uh, uh, across campus and you looked concerned. I said, oh, man. Uh, that's how intimate it was. I then went back in 1966 for three years and worked in the president's office after I received my doctorate. And by that time, ISU had, I think, 12,000 students, okay? That is a humongous growth. It might be, I might be off a, a few digits or double digits, but it, it had grown and the building structure had, the, the infrastructure had grown and the Board of Higher Education had been created under Lyman Glenny's uh, uh, leadership uh, and as it, evolved into the system of systems and later into all the, the changes that have occurred. It was a growth period for much of that time. Well, after uh, then in 1977, I went to Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville as the president and then later as the chancellor. That was another period. And by that time, there was still growth, but it was pretty clear that we didn't have all the money that we'd like to have. And I have to tell you, in 1966, I thought there must be an awful lot of money for all that was going on. The point of all of this is there's been a lot of change in higher education, and you've just seen the few years, you know, what the last seven or eight, that have been most difficult. And I know that they have been most difficult. Uh, and this is the quick, sad reality. Uh, it's not just the Great Recession. If 202 was the highest year in funding, uh, in real terms, and things went south, as you know, the unpaid bills, the pension hole, the, the two-year impasse, the low state credit rating, and now there's some light. Uh, MAP is a bright spot, budget. You now have a budget, 10% uh, reduction, uh, fiscal year 2018, but you have a budget. But you still have, we have, now I, and I'm a citizen of the state, uh, and so I say we, and I'm a, pretty healthy taxpayer. Uh, big enrollment declines in many of our institutions, out-migration issues, uh, competition for state dollars, for all kinds of things. It's been a difficult time for you. 
and for your presidents and for those that are giving leadership on the campuses. A very difficult time. So the question I have for you, first of all, is there was a gravy train. I, I, believe me, there was. There was a lot of growth, a lot of good growth, and a lot of institutions that prospered, and um, all of them uh, are better than they were at the time. Uh, but will we return to those gravy train years? Will we see modest increase in state funds in the few, you know, say the next five years? Or will we see more cuts, but not of the size we saw in 208 uh, on through that time? Or will we see, excuse me, or will we see worse than that? What do you think? How many think uh, we're going back to the gravy train years? Woo-goo-woo! -woo. <laughs> Tom, no. I always remember when I worked at SIU when um, there were big changes coming about and there, people had to line up the votes. There was somebody that always had this train sound. There we go, woo-woo-woo. You don't remember that? No. That's how old I am. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Return to the gravy train years. How many think we're going to do that in the state of Illinois? Okay. I don't think so either. Uh, see modest increases over the next five years? How many think we're going to see modest increases? Boy. Uh, see more cuts, but not as bad as 2008? Okay. Worse than that? Okay. So worse than that and more cuts uh, win the prize today. Next question, if I were to ask this of your faculty in general, what do you think they would say? Anybody have an opinion? I don't know, I'm just asking. I think our faculty would say the same thing. Okay, okay. Then somebody's doing a good job of educating them. Yeah. Any other comments? Maybe it, things will be better. But clearly, there's a lot to be done. Um, and change is inevitable, and we're going to talk about that too. Uh, and uh, that'll be the last thing I talk about. You'll be happy to hear that. Um, okay. So you're, you're entering a time you've learned about all the ways you can get involved in litigation. And that's scary, I know. You're also going to learn how finance and accounting and auditing and all that has changed and the increase in responsibilities, not just for people who are on those committees. Some of you are on those committees, but for every board member. Oh, well, at least we got some people that know the answer. Chicago Tribune wants to overhaul and consolidate the dysfunctional system, force specialization, consolidate back office, find new sources of income. We can turn to Wisconsin to link two and four year institutions. Uh, we can turn to others who think it's all administrators. We can turn to others that we can solve it by having the faculty teach more. And we can turn to others by getting in an arms race and spending more on recruiting. There's all kinds of things we can do. I'm sorry, folks. There's no one answer to this. There is not an answer. It's an essential re truth that things are going to be difficult. And I wrote this before I knew what you were going to say about how you predicted the future and how you saw the faculty predicting the future. Uh, so I turned to Dear Abby. I always read Dear Abby in the morning. And here's what she said to me. She said, Buzz, it's not the situation that is the problem, but it's our reaction to it. Okay, That's social psychology 101, by the way. Uh, but uh, it's our reaction to it. So what are, what are our choices? We have one choice. We move on, we move wisely, we move bravely, but we move on. We do things. We take responsibility and we work hard at it. We acknowledge and we adapt. We need a climate for change. And I'm almost getting to the topic here. If we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting what we're getting. Change is inevitable, folks. I, I, what's it going to be? We'll see. But we need to be resilient as trustees, 
as administrators, as faculty and staff, and dealing with all of these competing interests and desires. Let's talk about audits, audit. If, here's the take home, and uh, doggone it anyhow, I have two booklets I want you to, to uh, think about getting, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll comment on them when that, they show up, because I lifted a lot from these. Uh, but I think every board uh, should have a number of these copies. But if there's a take home here besides get these books, they're little booklets, is focus on killer errors, particularly in the audit function. So are these killer errors? First, this is outside of higher education. These are true, except I made the third one up, but I know it's true every day. Uh, the quarters sheriff. This is in an upstate, uh, well-to-do uh, upstate New York uh, uh, village that has a beautiful lake and is, has a lot of people come in during the summer. So one of the ways they keep the budget balanced is that you, anywhere you park, you have to put quarters in. Okay, makes sense. It's a, it's a good, good policy. It's, a, it's sort of like paying the tax for the, for the Coca-Cola in uh, Cook County, I suppose. Um, except the sheriff is a small village and the sheriff's responsibility was every day to clean out all of those uh, places where the money is put and take it home, you know, keep it organized, and then it goes to the bank. Okay, fair enough, all right? Well, he'd been doing that for like 10 years. Things were going pretty well. And he decided to, that he and his wife at New Year's Eve needed to have a really nice night on the town. So they did. And so, you know, you can imagine that the, the babysitter was going to make a little bit of money. So he comes home and he pays her off in quarters. A lot of quarters, okay? That's when this little thing became a killer error. Certainly for him, uh, wasn't a big, I mean, don't get me wrong, compared to the killer errors we're going to be talking about, it's this small. And then there's the Weed Whacker 5 personal experience uh, at, at an institution I'm familiar with where uh, they had a lot of land, they needed weed whackers, and they got tired of going through the whole process of bidding for weed whackers. Uh, give the top four or five people um, who, who work in, in maintenance and everything a credit card so they can go out and buy these at Walmart and say, get, pay, pay half as much and much less uh, rigmarole about it. But what happened is that the Weed Whacker 5 was sort of skimming off the top. And uh, somebody finally turned them in. And there's, of course, every place has a petty cash penny, or it could be pat, keeps track of the pe petty cash and takes a little bit aside. Compared to the killer errors that you talked about earlier, they're small, but they're nevertheless, when you see them, you have to deal with them. Now, how about these as killer errors? Uh, you didn't get into that much today. Is that first one there a killer error? Okay, it has enormous moral and ethical implications, but it also has enormous financial implications, as I think she was alluding to. Uh, and so your job is not to construct the policy. Your job is to ensure that a sensible policy has been uh, constructed and that it's being handled properly. Okay, if you do, if you do that, you've done your, your duty, your fiduciary duty. Uh, NCAA, we got U of I, who else? Northern, SIU, uh, and ISU, Division I. And then what else we got? We got other division, we got other uh, NCAA and then, then other kinds of conferences. Uh, poorly constructed system to ensure adherence to the rules. Okay, it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be violations. As a matter of fact, uh, when I arrived at Syracuse, there was a big scandal, and we spent more money than I'd like to think to get to the bottom of it, and more money than I'd like to think to try to prevent this from happening, to the point of having several lawyers on the staff, to the point of, of if a student came, a student athlete came in 
uh, with a new car, we had to find out about it, or wish to. Uh, but the systems at that time in most of higher education were pretty bad. Tom? And maybe everybody's well ahead of me on this, but where is the whole, where does the world of college football and concussions come into this discussion? And I mean, is there potentially down the road or today financial liability in a huge way in this area? That is a good question. Uh, uh, it's too bad that Mary Pat is no longer here. Uh, my guess is, uh, talking about due diligence, you're, you're not uh, people who design helmets, you're not people who design the rules, uh, but you are people that need to be informed about the issue and how it's being handled and to have somewhat of a comfort level. Um, I think it's a very tenuous thing particularly for the NCAA, and for even more so for pro sports, but even probably just as much for 12-year-old football, boys and girls who are playing football. Because a lot of those kids, now that we find out uh, that um, it isn't just a serious concussion that can cause some of this damage, it can be a series of micro concussions over time. And so yes, I think it's, I, I don't know how you handle it in an audit way, other than to say, what is your policy? Okay, let's be very specific, and I'm not a lawyer. What is your policy when a student uh, uh, appears to have, do you have somebody on the field uh, that is, that's working uh, that uh, identifies when a student may look like they have had a, a concussion, even small, and what is the protocol? And are you, ha are you following that protocol? I, I, my guess is everybody, and I don't want to dwell on this, my guess is everybody has So much money in it. I get that. I'm not, this is a, this is more a question. I'm not advocating one way or the other. But this is going to, you know, pun intended, come to a head sooner than later. I don't disagree. And and it's easy to put it to the side because of you know Alabama is not going to stop college football, but or USC or Notre Dame. But it is a real, real serious problem. That the more we hear about it, the more we talk about it, the more we're educated. It's not going in the right direction. I, I share your concern, and where it's going, it's really hard to tell. Uh, but, but clearly, there are parents now in uh, suburban Chicago uh, who aren't letting their young, their young children play football. Uh, I have a place to do this. I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it becomes financial. All of, that's a, okay, that's a takeaway, too. Everything now is financial. Uh, Conflicts of interest that you you got that you got uh, so those are killer errors. Can you think of a killer error that legal counsel or I haven't mentioned? Was there you know one that's obvious to you that an audit ought to be looking at? The less uh, you know the more the obvious ones w would be of course finance. Is your institution actually you know? handling its budget, budget wisely and, it, and is it able to handle uh, that thing. But beyond the financial, can you think of others? Yes? Not being able to uh, protect the private information? Not being able to, good point. And that's, that's uh, the person who wrote the thing I'm going to tell you about, uh, the person's name uh, as soon as I see it. Uh, it's exactly right that uh, uh, there is a liability there if the institution doesn't have protocols for dealing with information. Not, now we're not talking so much about freedom of information, we're talking about the misplaced use of information. Like my credit card being used or whatever, yes. It's good, that's a very good one, yes. Yes. 
Yeah, and that is one of the things we'll be, we'll, I'll be showing you, but you're absolutely right. That is another one where you could have some huge errors. You don't think they're, they're huge, but they are. Any others? Yes? Non-funded mandates. Okay, and not meeting those non-funded mandates. These are ridiculous. We're not going to do it. Well, yes, but we have to do it. Yeah, and so then you as auditors or the finance committee have to ask the question, how are we going to do it? And under the law, you're not in a position to say, well, you made a re really reasonable Mr. President or Ms. President. You made a very reasonable presentation. You don't have to worry about that mandate. Can't do that. So, yes. Pension obligations finding their way back to the income statement of the university. Excellent point. You want to elaborate a little bit on that? I'm a pensioner, so I'm just a little worried about what you might say. No, go ahead. So the state of Illinois, of course, pays that on our behalf. Yes. If we needed to pay that, we simply can't. Yes. In any way, shape, or form going forward. Yes. Yeah, and so then what is our, our responsibility and how do we respond as institutions if there is uh, some pressure for the institutions to take over the pension obligations? Dramatic change in our business model. It would be a dramatic change, would it not? Yeah. 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 But keeping in mind that the reason we're in this position where people like me in 1970 seven who pushed for expansion, hiring more people, uh, and making sure that our people were well paid uh, and fairly paid and everything, none of which helped the pension. In IBHE's defense, every year, in the annual report to the legislature and the governor, they talked about the imbalance at that time. But at the same time, we all paid lip service to that. We, where our push came, was for the other things. And so we're sort of seeing some of that wonderful gravy year come back to us now. Any others? These are good. Please help me. I like these. Any other uh, killer errors that, that uh, we might be interested in? Yes. And now it is. Now yes. we are having to function more like private institutions. Yes. I and mean, we have to think like private institutions. Yes. In terms of fundraising and other sources, revenue and so forth. So we don't have the, the, the reporting mechanisms in place, both financial reporting and others, to effectively run the business. Mm -hmm. and a, and a, and it's a killer if you don't get that. It's a killer error, and a good board is going to be raising those questions and is going to be asking questions about. Uh, how our money is now coming in and how it's being spent. Uh, and uh, uh, understood now that the students uh, will pay more for uh, the, uh, uh, an addition to the workout facility, but to ask those tough questions. Uh, and they're, they're all good. And don't get me wrong, I don't think there are buildings built that uh, were, uh, shouldn't have been built as much as it's a question of what we can afford to do now and what we can afford to do with the resources we have and how sometimes we can raise the money and sometimes we have to find it in other ways and what are those ways and uh, are they legal? <laughs> Any others? Yes, here's one here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, adjusting uh, debt security and security accounting. Well, uh, Lacks security in student housing and the question is does that mean that you ought to be out there making sure uh, that there's security in housing? No. The question is you need to know what the security is and feel comfortable with it. And having been through that at, at SU, uh, guess who the biggest culprit is? The students. Uh, because, <laughs> right? Uh, you, uh, the door is open at a residence hall and uh, people are you know, supposed to come in that have 
and are checked in some way. We had this in Syracuse, and it's, it's just too many, too fast, and there are people that come in that don't belong, and then what happens, something bad happens, and then what happens, you get sued. There was a hand somewhere else. Yes? This is my own personal opinion, but I think it's a killer error for any discussions for the unification of the boards for higher ed in the state of Illinois. And ah. That'll be an interesting topic. You, you, can, you ought to go to the editorial board of the uh, Tribune. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I did too. Well, you know, okay, I'll, I'll tell you, I've served under every possible board configuration. At Wisconsin, there was one governing board. Here, there were, at the time, there were, I think, five uh, governing boards and then the IBHE, and now every school has uh, a governing board. Uh, I have to, I can tell you that it can work in any way you do it but it's really the culture behind it. And if the culture is positive and constructive and honest, it can work. Maybe you can fine tune it a little, but that matters less than some kind of major structural change, one way or another. I've never seen one of those major structural change do much to change and improve the culture. That's an aside of mine. Okay, any other killer errors? All right, thank you, this is good. Okay, what's your role? Fiduciary, obviously, and some of you already talked about some of these. Thank you. Uh, financial reporting, internal control, compliance, and risk management. There's our guy, Richard Stasloff, uh, and that'll be on in your papers there. This is a, uh, and I says you, you no, I'm not an auditor. Uh, this guy is really smart, and it's about probably 15 pages long. And it's what you need to know as a lay person uh, about an audit committee and the audit function in higher education. This guy does not work for AGB. He writes some of these things for them. I guess he pay him, but he's an independent consultant of his own and is really bright. I highly recommend it. But anyhow, compliance and risk management you raised. Not a lot of that when I first started out as a president, and frankly, uh, if you ask me who the internal auditor was, I probably didn't know. Uh, and uh, I certainly must not have cared a lot. But uh, uh, you know now, and you know that there's a different set of rules, such as you as a president don't usually hire the internal auditor anymore. But anyhow, the last two are really, and internal control a little bit, are really the ones that have changed the most. Okay, and uh, this is just another way of saying it. Uh, overs oversight of the external audit. Um, the external audit, do have, um, things might have changed here in the state. Does each institution have an uh, external auditor, its own external auditor? Yes, it's chosen. Okay, and so is it, is it uh, a state uh, functionary that's doing it, or is it they just choose the firm? Okay, yes, okay, good. Uh, that is a change, yes, okay. Uh, so uh, oversight of that is very important. Um, it would be expected, I would expect that a good audit committee um, and, and a good board would want to know that the audit committee is doing this, would know um, what the internal audit plan was for this year and would know which areas uh, uh, would be covered and at the end of the year, uh, which, uh, uh, any problems with that, uh, that uh, occurred. Similarly, would have a good relationship with the external auditor coming in and know the same things. Quick it's, question. Yes. Do any of the other boards meet with the external auditor? I mean, do you have meetings they come and meet with the, uh, they come with the year? How many, uh, let's see, raise the hands. Your, your school is? Western. And Northern. Northern. ISU. ISU. Yes? Okay, and so you have a you have a time with them. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and so then they can report. Anybody who doesn't have that, you should. 
You, you, you definitely should. All right. And look at the expansion under oversight. Strategic risks. You talked about those, a lot of those this morning. Uh, first presentation, talked about a lot of them uh, already in this presentation. Training. You're not doing the training, but you need to ensure that there's continuous improvement. How that's being done and what are the results of the work. Internal control improvement initiatives. Donor imposed gift restrictions. Compliance. How do you feel about how do you feel about your institution? Well, we better not get into that. Uh, is that a problem at some places? Let's put it that way, where uh, money is being used for something other than what it was restricted to use for. You just need to know that it's not happening and you need some kind of reporting. Uh, and while we're on this, uh, with respect to the foundations, you need to ensure that there is an arm's length relationship, yes, but not such a long arm. And uh, my guess is everyone here, and I've worked with a couple of you, uh, have members of your board that are on the, uh, the foundation. Uh, and my guess is that you, uh, have a set of rules and you know rules of engagement for lack of a better term that that dictates how you do things is that a fair assumption Most, yeah uh, ISU has a foundation and I was on the board for yeah. a few years and they have an audit committee or at least they did yeah uh, I, I, up until recently I was also on the ISU board of trustees yes Uh, I guess what I'm saying is you should know how that money is being spent and how it's being handled and you should have a good feeling that it's going for what it's supposed to be going for. Okay. Yeah, I mean that doesn't mean you got to audit the auditors as much as you should, you should know those things. And as I said to one, it's not an institution you're familiar with, as I said to uh, one institution that had serious problems with the foundation. And, and they said, but you know, I, it's just not worth the trouble of digging into it. They've got a lot of clout in the community and so on and so forth. And I said, I'll tell you what, when it hits the fan, it's not gonna be the foundation that gets the stuff coming. It's gonna be you, it's gonna be your board. Uh, and that's, you know, the truth is, that's the way it is. And so you need to have that involvement, but uh, not overly involved. Oh, anything else on this? So that's the, those are all changes uh, in oversight. And risk management has really changed. Does the place have strategic goals? day-to-day -day activities in pursuit of the goals. That's an important one. It's uh, one thing to have quotes, a strategic plan, and then uh, goals to meet the uh, plan. It's another thing to be sure that's how the money is being spent and what the results are. Organizations, physical assets, and financial resources. That's, that's an easy one in the sense you should have that, always have that. Um, Internal and external reporting requirements, that's been gone over, and it, it's, everything is true. The public image, my God, did I ever think that the audit committee would be dealing with that? I never did, but I've been retired for a while. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the truth is, is it be, can become a, a financial uh, situation, particularly if there are conflicts of interest, we can go down the list. If there's sexual harassment kinds of things that aren't being handled well, if NCAA violations occur, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
they have, uh, the public image aspect has huge financial implications. Anything here? Any comments or questions about the audit function as it applies to expanding risk management? Okay. Okay, don't fall into these traps. This is Stasloff, by the way. He knows more than I do. He'd tell you more than I will, too, more than you'd want to know. Uh, don't, uh, not meeting with the external auditor. You really should do that. You should know what they have on their mind. You should get to know them, even though they're changing, uh, my guess is. Uh, failing to analyze the expenditures of the CEO's office. I, I, that's not an annual thing, but it's not something that should be ex excluded from an internal auditor, audit uh, if, in fact, you get to that level in your internal audits. Uh, because there could be situations, and I, I've dealt with some boards where I've asked the question, is this uh, an improper role for a board? Uh, is it not a good thing for the board? Uh, and the president says, no, it's not a good thing. It shows me that you don't trust me. Well, what that shows me is that the president shouldn't be trusted, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, so, once in a while you need to do that. And you had mentioned not uh, safeguarding information security. Boy, oh boy, how would you go about doing that? Any, any of our institutional colleagues that, are, that have a means of doing that, that you're comfortable with? So, so there are benchmarks that uh, corporations need to follow. Is that what you're saying? Yes, there may be institutions too. I'm not familiar yeah. with what those are, but as long as we do follow the benchmarks, yeah. then we should be safe. Yeah. I, for one, am very intimidated by this discussion. And uh, I, if I were still in the business, I would really need to have some people that I really trusted to help me. Because this is, I mean, you're, you're dealing in a really difficult area here, but it is a killer air, folks. Anybody have a comfort, comfort level? We've got a couple of presidents here. Yes? In the non-academic world, the, our auditors do process in information security auditing, and uh, we also hire outside consultants for that. Yeah, okay. How about uh, the presidents? Do you have an outside consultant that you bring in for this kind of thing? Well, okay, you got two things going here. One is that you want to do the right thing, uh, and the other is you want to be sure you followed your, your fiduciary responsibility, because you don't know what the right thing is. I mean, you can do all this stuff and still end up uh, like Equifax or somebody. Uh, and so, I mean, maybe they did all the right things, but you need to have processes in place and you need to evaluate them and to follow them. Okay, we're going to go to financial oversight. How are we doing? Let's see. I go to tw that's right, 12:30. I'm good. I'm good. Not good at this, but good. Uh, all right. Uh, any qu other questions on audit? Okay. Principles: a clearly stated mission, accompanied by statements of vision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera creates the foundation for being able to be effective members of a board looking at the financial aspect of the university. All board members should have a basic understanding of the financial condition of their institution. All board members, okay? Now, use my treatise. Uh, if I don't understand it as a board member, it's your fault. I'll take the time if you'll explain it to me. But I don't want to uh, six inch thick uh, report. I want to understand what the basic principles are and I think each, each and every one of you can do that. And you can be a, an art major and you can do that. Trust me. And not just a few members that you rely on. There will be people that know more than you know, sure. Uh, and make sure that the decisions are aligned with strategic options. 
Ask that question. Because your president will be happy that you asked that question. Uh, there's a plan. We're, we're supposed to follow it. But I'm getting pressure to do this, <coughs> this, and this. Board asks, what are the, uh, how does it align with your strategic options? And this is nose in. Keep your nose in this stuff, but your fingers out. OK? We don't need another finance officer. We need people uh, who are going to look at it from a board perspective. This is the person, and, and I have these two books, and I have them in my briefcase. Uh, but and you, it's written there. Uh, this is another little uh, booklet that you can get. Uh, by this lady, I think, is at the University of Missouri System. Uh, and she has written this. These are both recent, this one and the audit one. These are really great things to have. OK, basic financial. Understanding how the institution is financially supported and capitalized. That you can do, folks. That you can do. Review, approving, and monitoring operating budgets. That has been the typical function of a finance committee. Metrics. You all have metrics? How do you feel about them? Are they, are they uh, connecting to the mission of the institution and to the strategic vision? Yeah.
As an aside, having tried this in New York, I was chair, the governor appointed me as chair of a committee to look at uh, common indices. Uh, and some of us thought that was great. And boy, some of them really hated it. And because they didn't like what they thought the comparisons were going to reveal. And, and so uh, I, I quite agree that you need this. And there's two ways of going about it. Uh, one would be yeah, form, a, form a working group that would come up with the definitions of what is needed and keep it as slim as you can uh, and as easy to report as you can. Uh, and another, you could do both, but another would be to, um, and I'm sure IBHE staff would know what states really have pretty good information systems, really, really good information systems and kind of steal from that, or maybe take both. Uh, but uh, that would be the question I would want to have too, and I wouldn't want 40 pages. Right. I would want, you know, 20 maybe, uh, of the most important and, and easy to understand, uh, but there they are. Anybody else have a comment on this? Yes. Mm-hmm, yeah. Well, there's an awful lot to include, and, and it requires serious discussion, and, and I would hope that, that you'd, you'd want to stay on top of this, uh, even though it's, it's bigger than you. But at your level, you want to know what you want to know, and uh, you, you need to work with uh, your, your university to, to make that happen. Uh, at Syracuse, which may not be a good comparison, uh, but it's my most recent, we had two kinds. We had dashboard indicators that were probably 12, and then we had uh, six or seven pages of all kinds of indicators. And the latter was for the, the, the person that just loves to dig into the information. But there was some good stuff in there. But you didn't have to read that to know how we were doing and what our challenges were. Engage I think at 245, this is the kind of discussion we're getting up to. Yeah. Great. That we can put together in a concise, simplified way because I, I, there's an art and an intelligence required to bring it down. There is. And that's not easy, but that's what you need to work on. So let's think, let's have that part of, that could be part of the discussion. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Someone else had it. Yeah, where? Oh, back here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you, you get to, uh, and this is the kinds of things that need to be discussed. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I, I could probably have an interesting discussion with you about it, having been on your side of it many times when I was at SIU. And I always, we always had, uh, when we did ours, and when we, at Syracuse, when we, when we did it, it was always the ones that looked a little like us, but also, aspir quotes, aspirational schools. Well... That's good to know, but it isn't particularly good to make policy over if you don't have much money. And so you just got to walk through this stuff and talk it out and come up with something. I'm glad you're doing that. Well, I, I also think, and Larry's done a good job with this at ISU, one of the documents he's prepared is a document that Bunk gets about tuition, debt, et cetera, that is also a, a worthwhile exercise. You, you, again, we talked about where's the Assembly, they would all say it's a lot cheaper to go to school in Missouri, it's a lot cheaper to go to school in Iowa, and I think that's a general perception among the public. 
Yeah. And this is one of those things that can, I believe can help you. So this is to me a very this is good for us to hear what you're what you yeah. want and what you think is helpful for your individual respective school. And if you learned anything this morning, it's that transparency. Uh, it's, so, it's what it is now. And so you're not going to hide these things. You might as well get them out. Okay, uh, let's see what else we got. Come on now. Why does it do that to me? Okay. Do you have a conflict of interest policy? Do you do? I take it. Do you like it? Is it being administered? Does it include key employees? Do you know? You're all new. So do you know? Do you have it? Yes? Okay. Uh, if you're a research institution, my guess the answer is yes. The intellectual property policy is up to date. Cost rates, subsidizing the research mission. It's good to know. Let's be transparent. Uh, that's an interesting one that, that she included. Uh, Procedures to guide the establishment of ongoing relationships. It's just, it's more than a foundation, isn't it? What others, I mean, I've seen others that were connected to businesses uh, that needed to have some oversight. Has the institution taken an enterprise approach? Can anybody tell me what an enterprise approach to risk management is? Yeah. A corporate well, is that, you said a corporate approach. Uh, there's a, on page, I forget, I read it about three times, and I think what it told me is that enterprise risk management, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, the, old, the old type, is there's all kinds of risk management now, and it's not just straight financial. It's all these things that we've been talking about. But I was hoping somebody would enlighten me. A really big time. Uh, is the board aware of high operational finance company? Reputational risks, yes. Same as with the audit. Do's and don'ts. Don't get mired in detail. Uh, if you want to, it's fine, except maybe you shouldn't use the whole board or the finance committee to do it. You know, get your individual, uh, sit down with somebody that understands it uh, on staff uh, and and dig into it, but most people don't need to do that. Uh, do expect a, a, a response to questions in a timely manner, not being answered on the spot. Some of these are very difficult questions. And red flag, if nobody understands what the information is, and if administration can't answer the question, there's a problem. Okay. I got it's nine minutes. Can I take it? Uh, this is what does my heart good because I went through major restructuring uh, and I've written a number of things, including part of a book on this topic. So I try to boil it down to five minutes. Uh, if you have to make cuts or strategic decisions. Uh, yeah. They can't hear me. Oh, woo. Mike. Mike. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I was talking through this. No wonder it was. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so uh, these are obvious. Be guided by the mission. You're making cuts. Are you adding things? It should. Does it fit with the mission, or does everybody need a 40,000 seat stadium? Uh, reduce, but in reinvest. That's really important. When you're cutting, you need to be spending some money consistent with your mission to move forward. And I just don't have any tolerance to hear. Well, we can't because we're making cuts. It's a question of the will to do it. And uh, it's been done. Uh, allow for participation. It's not a time to get in the, in, the, in the back room somewhere, which you were told earlier on shouldn't do anyway. Communicate all the time. Do this because it's best for your institution. Be open and own the narrative. Now, you know what the narrative, the narrative basically is your story. So what's your story? At Syracuse, when we went through 17% cuts in budget when I, when I arrived over a three year time period, uh, and we had a very brief, easy narrative. We are aspiring to be 
the student-centered research university. Notice those words, student-centered research? Because we were a research university, we weren't MIT, but we were a research university, but we wanted to be student-centered because we didn't feel that a lot of the schools that are research universities are. And that's what drove our cuts, that's what drove where we put our new money, uh, and we, we created new money while we were making these cuts. Uh, own the narrative. You need to know what your narrative is, because if you don't have a narrative, somebody else has it for you. Uh, a lot of people will have it. Willingness to get help. That's why I, I bang on these two publications. That's help. Going to a conference helps. Uh, this kind of meeting helps. But get help from other people. And understand the emotional component. Any social workers here? Uh, Kubler-Ross, if you ever read her book on death and dying, how do we respond when a loved one or we find out we are going to die? There's a stage, four stages. First we deny, then we're angry, then we bargain, and then we finally come to some acceptance and we deal with it. Okay? I think it's fairly clear that organizations going through grief, and that's what this is, go through the same four stages. And as they go through these four st stages, and I've seen it, and I've consulted with, with presidents, uh, the first one is denial. And that's where you say, if we just got rid of administrative bloat, or if the faculty would just teach three more classes every two years, or whatever. And you can, and you know, these are all things to look at, but it's denial if you think that's going to solve all of the issues that you have. Uh, then I've seen the anger, and the anger is very emotional. Uh, and uh, this is why president, uh, boards need to understand what presidents are going through with this stuff. Uh, I counseled with one person that lost his job. Uh, and we remained good friends, very good friends. But he went to a place that had serious financial difficulties. Uh, it was his decision. And uh, he, he, uh, we talked about how he would farm all, doing all the things that I mentioned, and so he set it up to involve people and to, to stick with the mission and make the changes, but they had to be made, and it was just about ready to go out, uh, and so he starts talking to faculty, and he tended, he was from uh, another state in the Midwest, and like myself, uh, if he's not careful, his grammar can not always be good. I grew up in Edwardsville, uh, and so, uh, <laughs> Uh, that being the case, he went to the English department. They were incensed because he had a grammatical error and they wanted him fired on the spot. Uh, he's not one of us. And there was this kind of, you know, illogical anger. Well, they never got past the anger stage. And he didn't stay. Uh, and uh, that was the best thing that ever happened to him. But. Uh, uh, Institutions do go through these things, and you can lead an institution through these stages. And I, they're not always the same, but I, I would contend that anger is always present. And when you see a vote of no confidence, be sure you're getting all the information. And be sure it's not just anger uh, because of the situation. Uh, so give people the tools to change. That's spending money while you're cutting budgets. It's really very important care about the people, boy, that's a tough one. We had to lay off a lot of people, and we cared. And so we had a, a plan that at the time legal counsel said we might be able to do, and so we did it. Uh, but we trained the people that had to talk to the people about layoffs. Uh, we had consultants come in to train them so they, they would do it at the right time and in the right way. And we gave them fairly generous uh, uh, payouts uh, and also said that if, if we let them go, they're welcome to try to apply for other jobs as they come up. And we spent a lot of time doing that, and I think it showed. You roll out the plan, and you have high expectations for management and the faculty uh, to make it happen, and uh, it's their plan. Uh, and you give support to campus leadership until they show you that they don't deserve it. But don't give up too early. These are tough jobs these days, folks. That's my little thing for you when you're dealing with your college presidents. It's a much tough, tougher job than it was five years ago. Much tougher. 
And uh, I'm just amazed and really impressed with the quality of people I see that are willing to undertake this. I think I should quit because I'm guess it's 1230. All right, we're gonna go next door for lunch. Yeah. We've got an hour. We're gonna try to get your food and seated uh, within 15 minutes. Jay Bergman um, is gonna lead a, his conversation or a, some issues he wants to bring up or is gonna bring up for about a half hour. Then we'll have about another 15 minute break and we'll be back in here at uh, 1.30, if I'm not mistaken. So thank you all for being here and we're gonna literally go right next door. And, well, it's actually down the hall. Oh, it's down the hall, I'm sorry. Okay, go that way. Well, sir, how appropriate. So we'll, we're gonna go down that way. So thank you all.